like said Biciales, polite, well spoken. <laughs> well like, spoken. The most That's like yeah. Oh my goodness. It was so beautiful. I mean everybody's We're so very, nice. you're like okay, anyway. Right. <laughs> I think you're really like just to let you know. Just came okay, back. Hi everybody. Hi, everybody. I was telling Ingrid here that I just came back from speaking at a um, uh, conference, hipotecario, so a mortgage conference in um, in Bogota, Colombia. And one of the things I was most taken aback by was just the friendliness, the amicableness, the like at your nice. service uh, of the people there. I mean, I feel like if I could help. So that's the first thing I thought. If I can bring people over there and get them on work contracts here, <laughs> I'd have like the best customer service in the world. <laughs> that's the first that's thing. That's awesome. I thought, but very cool. Yeah. So we are doing a home buyer workshop today. We're going to talk about all things mortgages and all of that fun hey, yeah, stuff. So <laughs> we are going to be going, we've got live on YouTube and TikTok. Whoops. Which. Hilarious. Okay. So. And hopefully we get over 1.7 million views on TikTok because. Oh, sure. My sister just dropped a video on TikTok and she got over one. She went viral. Wow. In like three days. That's awesome. So if I can beat her, that, that, that'd be. Uh, you want awesome. to. <laughs> yeah. I don't think this is going to go viral necessarily. I think you have to do like something a little more. Um, yeah, a little more in your face instead of a home buyer workshop. But you know, it's it's cool. I I'm good. Hello, this is Kurt. Hi, hey, Kurt. Kurt. One of my current clients trying to work and find him a nice home. <laughs> Very cool. Well, we will work on that. Okay, so we have in person and we have online. So I will try and monitor the comments. Um, a bit so that we can actually see what on earth is going on. <sighs> so, all right, why don't, hold on. Okay. So today we're actually going to do one in English and then we're going to do one in Spanish. All right. Right. First mm -hmm. hour is in right. English <laughs> and I get to be comfortable. And then the second hour is in Spanish, and I get to be slightly uncomfortable because my Spanish is pretty much... You're going to be comfortable, too. <sighs> yeah. You guys will be nice to me, right? <laughs> All right. So I'm going to actually put this over here. Okay. So um, I wrote a few of the questions up on the board of uh, what people ask the most. Um, but a lot of times it's just like what to get started on and where to get started. So... You are our guest lender for this webinar right. workshop. So my name's so. Fabian. I'm from American Bank Shares Mortgage. Uh, we have an office here in Marion County, right on 17th Street. But um, anyways, the, the proposed question, you know, what do you look for when you're, what, what do you need to look forward to when you're wanting to take a step out and, hey, I want to get financing for a home. What do I need? You know, if you're like me, sometimes if you're taking a step into the unknown, like you procrastinate it and you keep putting it off. So I'm going to flip the script here and I'm going to tell you what a loan officer or, um, you know, a, 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 you know, someone who can help you on the pre-approval process to get you started. I'm going to tell you what I am going to ask you. So basically in 12 minutes, it's a 12 minute conversation you could have with any loan officer and it's nothing to be intimidated by. You don't have to have anything prepared, but uh, I know Geico coined the phrase 15 minutes can save you something or something. <laughs> I, I probably can't save you uh, any money, but you know, I, can help you. Anyway. I can definitely help you make a lot of money over 30 years. I mean, let's be honest. I think the statistic is like um, uh, the majority of Americans wealth is in their home. Okay. So maybe you don't own a business. Maybe you, you have a, a clock in clock out job, but you can build wealth by home ownership and that's powerful. And you may not understand it now, but I promise you in 10, 15 years, you will. So what is a loan officer going to ask you? They're going to sit down and say, hi, how are you? Blah, blah, blah. We're going to start a conversation. The first thing they're going to ask you is what you do for a living. Uh, hey, I work at Publix. I'm a deli clerk. I make $20 an hour. Uh, do you, how many hours a week do you work? I work 40 hours a week. They're probably going to get a little bit granular. Are, are, do you work 40 on the button or sometimes variable 37, 40, 39.6? <laughs> then I'm going to ask you to work any overtime. Um, so 
you know, a, a big part of uh, lending is determining your ability to repay. How do we do that? Well, we compare your monthly income um, and then we compare that with your monthly debt. So the first questions are going to be, uh, how much do you make an hour? How many hours a week do you work? What I'm looking for is, hey, is your income fixed or is it variable? Or do you have a history of working 40 hours a week on the dot? Because if I can see like four checks with 40 hours a week on the dot, then we're going to have no problems. I can qualify you for the maximum that your income supports. Now, yeah. Can I just break in real quick? This is basically the most important time not to exaggerate and not to lie. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Don't do that. Don't do that. Be like, oh, well, you know, I get about, you know, I got to make myself look better. Don't do that. Okay. It's actually better to be a little conservative than it is to exaggerate just because you're going to go based off of what they say at first. Yep. Right. And then, and then you're going to get the documentation later. Yeah, so you never want to show off to the loan officer. The loan officer is trying to get a real deal feel of where you're at, how much money you make, and what we can do with what you got. I mean, the, the loan officer is a guy or the woman who's going to make miracles for you. So be as black and white and as honest as you can because what happens is after the loan officer, uh, your file is going to go from desk to desk to desk to people you'll never meet. They're going to ask for verifications of employment from your job that – that you can't embellish there. The Someone from your HR department is going to fill it out. And that is what it is. So if you could tell us the truth. Anyways, so after I determine how much money you actually make, then I'll ask if you have any other income. Uh, sometimes people get Social Security benefits for this or that. Uh, Fabi and I get child support. Well, that's qualifiable income. If you've been receiving that child support for 12 months, it can be used. Fabi and I get alimony. Well, if you've been receiving it for, you know, uh, if it's court documents, we could probably use it. Uh, and then we're going to go into kind of painting out your debt. So um, I'm going to ask you, you have a car payment. Uh, what do your monthly liabilities look like? Remember utilities, insurance, phone, none of that stuff counts. Just like um, a firm would count if you have like a Peloton that you're paying for the machine or if you have rooms to go debt. I'm going to look at all that. So we're going to ask how much do you owe on your credit card? What's the minimum payment? I'm going to get through all that. And then I'm going to ask about taxes. Do you owe any money to the IRS right now? Have you filed taxes? And for everybody out there that has not filed your taxes yet, you need to file your taxes. Um, a lot of these government uh, loans like FHA, USDA, um, they're all hooked up with the IRS. So if, uh, if you have any kind of debt or if you haven't filed, that needs to be taken care of. Speak to your loan officer about, hey, what should I do about my taxes? Be very honest. They can give you good advice so it doesn't mess you up when you go to qualify. Um, then we're going to get into just painting some uh, living history. Uh, if you have rent, they're going to want to see that you've paid it on time. If maybe you live rent free with family for a long time, it's super common. No problem. Uh, and How then, can they support that uh, paying on time rent? So it kind of depends on the program, like which loan outfit you do. But sometimes they'll ask for a VOR, a verification of rent, and sometimes they won't. So if you've been living rent-free with family, it's usually a non-issue. If you've been playing, paying a realtor for rent, let's say for the past six months, you know there's a good chance we'll reach out to the management company and say, hey, has this person paid on time? Uh, if you're like, some people freak out with the late payments. If you're like five, 10 days late a couple times, that's no big deal. What's important to us, if you have like 30-day lates, if you have any 30-day lates within the past 12 months, loan officer, bling, bling, bling. That yeah. could be a problem, okay? Oh, that's a problem for the yeah. <laughs> tenant too. That means they're, that's a problem they're for having everybody. some financial difficulties. But we get um, verification, uh, rental verification requests all the time, all the time. And basically, I mean, it's like click, click, we're done. All we have to do is print out the tenant's ledger and, you know, email it over. Mm -hmm. So it's super, super easy. Um, but a, a regular landlord that maybe doesn't use software, mm -hmm. they can go ahead and just fill out, you know, a piece of paper and put, oh, okay. sign their name on it and say, yeah, or even better, you can have receipts. So if you're paying with yep. money order, you have receipts for your rent, or if you have a check, you can show how many times the check to the landlord came out of your account and when. So I have a question. So sure. Someone doesn't have enough like credit history in other areas. No car loans or mm -hmm. maybe a small credit card, not enough credit history, but they are renting. Can that be used as a credit for qualification? So, uh, no. So in, in here in the United States, uh, credit is everything. Mm -hmm. So a, a big part of what I 
walk my borrowers through is how to play the game. Like, what do I need to get my credit higher? Um, uh, even in the non-government loans, like what's called what's called like bank statement loans or or investor loans, or mm -hmm. they're all heavily dependent on your credit score. Okay. So if you have no credit, there is really no viable option other than like a private benefactor that's going to write you a mortgage. I have heard of um, like Churchill Mortgage and stuff. Mm -hmm. There are specific mortgage companies um, that work with like Dave Ramsey or something like that, where they specialize in those kind of loans. But it's yeah. a very specialized field. They have cool. to do something called manual underwriting. Um, it, it's very different. So if you have no credit score, but you're paying your bills, there are some places that do that. That is not going to necessarily be like an FHA. They're going to expect 20% down. It's not the same thing. We're talking like it's more strict. Right. Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So um, if you're watching and you have bad credit, that's probably like 70% of what I do. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, it's very black and white. It's very transparent. If your credits, if you're out there watching and your credits in the 400s, don't that's be shy. Fine. You need to get started. You're probably not going to buy a house for a year. But you need to learn the rules to play the game so that over the next year you're working towards something and you can get into a house. Mm -hmm. If your credit's in the mid fives, I can probably get you into some, something in the next couple of months. Um, it's going to take a lot of work and effort. But um, the thing that I really recommend against is going to one of these fix my credit kind of people because those companies are going to charge you hundreds of dollars a month. And they're just going to go into litigation over everything. They're going to go in there. They're going to dispute all your trade lines and basically say that that's not my debt. And you're going to be paying for years and it's going to take a long time. So what's cool about going to a loan officer, some loan officers don't like to work with help people get credit up. And that's fine. You know, they're so busy that, you know, they don't really help, you do. help that demographic. But I do. And I close a lot of loans because of it. Thank God. So, uh, we have, <laughs> yeah. So we have simulators that work uh, directly with TransUnion, Equifax, and Experian, mm -hmm. uh, and it's no cost to the borrower. Uh, they cost us, so it's not free, but we pay for it. But the idea is, I don't get paid until I successfully close your loan. So you know, I we invest money into these simulators, into running your credit to fix it. So, um, and then. On the other side, you know, I ran across a registered nurse and she had excellent uh, or she had excellent history. She had one like Cox Cable thirty nine dollar collection. And um, I ran a simulator and I popped her up from a six forty six to like a seven eighty nine in two weeks. So so sometimes people just don't know that there's collections on there. Mm -hmm. And like mm -hmm. uh, if, if, if I were to show you on like a mortgage rate sheet, the difference in interest rate between six eighty nine and a 790, it's a big deal. So like having someone that you, you have to feel like the loan officer you're with is gonna help you and put you in the best light, shed the best light on your credit profile to get you to the right place. I think people are terrified of going into talk to a lender. They think you guys are all in a bank. I know full well y'all are yeah. most of your time that you're on your couch on your computer. So yeah. don't even but uh but they do. They're if like I was terrified. on my couch I'd have back problems. <laughs> <laughs> but you're like they're so scared there's gonna be like some guy at a bank in a three piece suit that's like judging them and like, yeah. you know, it's this really terrifying thing. No man, it's it's just another person and no judgment. You're gonna help them out and be like, you're not ready yet, but here's what we can do to get you ready. So and you I mean, know it's not a big deal information that they can provide oh, to help them yeah. you know, kind of organizing what do you need to do yeah you know to eventually buy your house that's i think that's the best way to talk to a loan officer yeah so they can really guide you y'all need to set up an office in planet fitness and be like this is the judgment free zone okay like yes. just, <laughs> just hang out here i don't know <laughs> whatever so yeah um credit profiles to all my 400s out there just spend 15 minutes investing in yourself with a loan officer and they can put you kind of in the right place. It's not going to be an overnight thing for people in the 400s, people in the low 500s. It's not going to be an overnight thing. Um, and you just want to have find yourself a loan officer that's willing to help you, that really cares and that wants to put you in the best light possible. Uh, number two, hey, Fabian, I have no credit. This might be something similar to what you were mentioning. I have no credit. I haven't had a credit card. Uh, since I'm 18 years old or I've never had a credit card, uh, what does that look like? Well, it's a solid six months process, okay? It's not difficult, but you basically, and here's free advice, um, internet. <laughs> you go to a credit union or a creditcard.com or 
you know, nerdwallet.com, fill in the blank here, and you open a secured credit card, you give them 300 bucks. And when you get your card in the mail, you go put $30 worth of gas. Um, you know, you wait, you put the card in the drawer and you get the bill. When you get the bill, you pay it down to $10. And then as soon as that trade line reflects on your credit karma or your nerd wallet or your third party system, then you go and you get another credit card, maybe try a department store or a gas card. And then you do the same thing, whatever their limit is, you, you spend 30% of what's on there. And then you put the card in the drawer and you wait for the bill. So now two billing cycles later or six months and now you have credit yeah. it's just that easy and uh it, it do not overcomplicate it if you have no credit it is just that easy but there is no way around getting six months it, it will take a solid six months my uh our son when he went to college we wanted him to establish credit um for because it does make things easier i mean it really does it makes things less expensive sometimes too without having to pay deposits or whatnot so we added him on authorized user yeah as an authorized yeah. user on one of our smaller yeah. cards and that established it almost immediately yeah um and then he was able to get you know to kind of skip ahead yeah <laughs> so if you have yeah, means to get someone um if you have a parent or a guardian or someone that's invested in your life and they're willing to add you as an authorized user onto their card that will uh cut that six month process way down oh, um, three. yeah about three months so yeah it helped three. Yep. It helped. But yeah, um, my daughter was just asking about that, but she's only 15. I was like, nah, no, <laughs> no, too early, too early. You, yeah. you get a checking account and I have to sign on that. So <laughs> it's getting established, but you know, there's a lot of adults out there that maybe had some fun in their twenties or something and they need to reestablish mm -hmm. stuff. But there's a lot of parents that don't talk about money at home yeah and so we have to learn the hard way there was a whole generation i think now mm -hmm. that never had those conversations and we're paying for it <laughs> i was one of them my oh, parents yeah I'm, I'm from another country so credit cards was not a no-no right. yeah that's a good thing yeah. and uh my dad gave everything cash to the same mm -hmm. cash 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 so i never learned until i came to this country what was the credit mm -hmm. card and i have to learn the hard way too you know yeah yeah. And that's actually very common in uh, in, um, in our Hispanic cultures mm -hmm. and uh, and kind of you know international demographics. Um, everything mm -hmm. is paid cash, and it, you know cash is king. Here in the United States, it's you have to learn how to play the credit game. Oh, yeah. Keep all your credit cards under thirty percent over sixty months. So yeah. if you have a thousand dollar limit, keep it under three hundred bucks, not just for one month, but for two months. Because what happens when you spend 300 bucks, then that billing cycle closes and now you have another billing cycle. Well, if you haven't paid the 300 bucks and you go and spend another 300 bucks, you now owe $600 on a thousand dollar limit. So your credit card utilization is 60 something percent. That's no bueno. Not good. <laughs> I always so. understood that if you have a credit card and you use it, if you need to use it all and you pay the whole amount when the cycle, you know, when you get right. the, the bill, that also is good. Isn't yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Like the trick is they, they want to see you using your cards responsibly. So over 60 days, you never want to go over 30%. And, um, you know, credit cards are powerful. You'll get points, you'll get all these stuff for using them. So if you wait for the cycle to close, then you get your bill. And as soon as you get your bill, pay it. Or as soon as your cycle bills closes, pay it. That's going to be great. and It's going to help you for sure. Mm -hmm. There are some, I mean, aside from a credit card, if you're just if you don't trust yourself with a credit card, um, I would pray maybe go to some of the other ways that you can establish credit, um, maybe taking out a small loan or something like that. And because you can do a secured loan yep. as well and then just pay that. And then you don't have that little credit card taunting you in your wallet. So, um, yeah. that's a great <laughs> point. Well, it's, you can, so, you can buy yeah. a computer or some kind of items that you have to pay monthly yep. and try to make higher payments Absolutely. so you can pay it up. Yeah. Yep. You don't have to get into a big debt, but you know, yeah. yep. establish some credit too. One of all, all these secured cards are going to be, I mean, it, it, it'll be alarming if they give you more than 500 bucks. Oh, Usually yeah. it's $300. Yeah. It's the way to get started. So if you try it and you only get 300 bucks, don't be scared. That's that's the norm. That's, that's yeah. the norm. That's what you gave $10,000. What? <laughs> they must have decided oh, you were like. Credit card? No, uh, no, first know. credit card probably. No, that's probably just credit card. Mm -hmm. I just because I have 
American Freight because I've been paying that off, buying yeah. sofa, like timing with my income tax. So they gained ten thousand spending limit. So that's actually a great point. So there is a difference between a secured card where you're giving them 300 bucks and then they're giving you a piece of plastic to spend those 300 bucks. And then someone who has credit established, you've been paying something. Now they're saying, okay, look, we, we see how you've been paying down that American freight card. We trust you with 10,000. You're not giving them the 10,000. They're just giving you, they're extending you a limit of 10,000 bucks. So that's, uh, that's an unsecured card because it's not collateralized by $300 cash. Um, and, and those are great. So, um, but I, I don't touch those. Yeah. <laughs> Smart man. Smart, Smart man. The Smart. wife got control of all that. <laughs> she touches them. Yeah. Yeah. yeah those She's are my accountant. <laughs> so accountant for accountability, basically. Yeah. Yeah. All I do is work. That's that works. That so I did want to summarize. Do not be freaked out by going to talk to a loan officer, any loan officer. We're all going to, we're all going to fill out. It's called a 1003, an application and do not be, it is not daunting. They're going to ask you about how much money you make. You're, you're, they want to paint a picture of your debt. So all your credit cards, your car payments, your affirms, your that. Do you owe all the IRS any money? And then they're going to ask you how much money you have in the bank. If I had a dollar for everybody that told me they have $500 in the bank or, or less than $500, I'd be a very rich man. Don't be freaked out. Just tell them the honest truth. There's a lot of programs out there that we're probably going to get into later that can help you close on a home. Uh, and then they're going to ask you about your credit score. So that's all they're really going to try to determine when you speak to a loan officer for the first time. So nothing to be freaked out about. So after they submit all the papers or they have the first conversation with the loan officer, what will be the next step for them? Oof. Okay. So the next step is documentation. Mm -hmm. um, I know your realtors know that, uh, honestly, for every 15 speak people I speak to, if three of them, if that initial conversation sounds viable, like they have a shot at getting something within the next 40 days, sorry. And uh, if I can get one person to give me their documents out of those three, I mean, it's, it's a good day. But that's, that's the toughest part. And uh, it's not hard, especially today. I mean, you can sit on your couch and you can knock out most of it in 15, 20 minutes. They're going to ask you for proof of those pay stubs, right? They're going to want 30 days pay stubs. They're going to want the last two years of W-2s. They're going to probably ask you for the last two years of tax returns. Um, they're going to ask you for a photo of your driver's license. And they're going to ask you for a couple months bank statements. So for the newer generations, that's literally 15 minutes on a cell phone. And you can have all of that in email in 15 minutes. So Most of that comes to like direct deposit. You'll have they email you your pay stubs. So, I mean, you've already got it digital. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, pretty much you already have most. And then even the driver's license, you're going to take a picture with your yeah. cell phone. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, super, super quick and easy on that. What are the most uh, common uh, situations that may um, prevent somebody from getting a loan? Um, honestly, credit. Credit. Like, I can't stress enough the importance of credit. I mean, uh, that no credit dave ramsey connection that's for people with a lot of money in the bank a lot yeah, of liquidity very, very and, much. and and everything cash so if you're at home and you have no credit and you have bad credit and you have no money don't get excited about that <laughs> that is not a thing for you yeah, that is so not a thing need, that's a whole program <laughs> so sometimes like for me uh, look in the industry we call them deal killers right so for me, a deal, a deal killer is if the credit's too low and the recent delinquencies, like like I ran into a borrower the other day that uh, hasn't paid his Amazon card within the last four months. So even though he had a 550, 560, and, a some, and another low five, which I probably could have done something, the fact that he was currently delinquent more than two months is a deal killer. There's nothing you can do. What? Like Even if you catch up today, that recent delinquency on credit cards is going to put you, set you back a year. What about income? Yeah. So, um, I kind of get on that soapbox a lot, right? So, <laughs> um, listen, there, there's no way to sugarcoat it. Prices of homes are expensive. Okay. So if you are a single individual and you make 20 bucks an hour and you work 40 hours a week, you probably can't afford a house in Ocala by yourself. And nobody wants to hear that, but that's the truth. Okay, if you don't have anybody co-signed for you, you're going to qualify for about $110,000 to $120,000. And there's no houses out there for that. And if you realtors want to look for houses out there, be my guest. But I just try to be transparent. 
And uh, they're, they're just, they don't exist anymore. And if they do, it's going to be a very tough shopping experience. But um, how many people can you put on a loan? Like if you have a partner, boyfriend, girlfriend, business partner, friend, and you guys want to get into business together, you, you can put up to six people on a loan. And uh, you don't have to be married. Okay. Yeah, you sure can. And I, I have college people that kind of do it all the time. And them and a few roommates, they go and they buy a big house. And, and it's certainly doable. Um, but um, two people making, you know, 15 to $20 an hour, definitely all day, you will qualify for the American dream to get started. So, uh, income is the hardest. Okay. Because I can hook you up with all the down payment assistance and all the government programs of the world, but, but your income versus your debt tells us how much you qualify for. So there's no way around, like either you lower the debt and sometimes there's no debt to lower. So you just, or you increase the income. And really the only way we increase income is by adding somebody else on the loan. So it's a harsh truth, but you know, it is what it is. So that's one of the things that they call a debt to income ratio. What are the ratios that people have to look at? Ooh. I know, right? Hard I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you a bunch of numbers right now and it's going to go in one year and out the other. Um, you know, because basic. a lot of people don't know how to qualify, how to calculate it. But you're going to take your yearly income, let's say you make $40,000 a year, and you're going to divide it by 12 months. It's probably going to be like, uh, uh, so it's going to be $3,333.33. And then you're going to multiply that by the number I'm about to give you. So $40,000 a year, you're going to monthletize it. I didn't make up that word. And you're going to divide it by 12 months. And then that figure is your gross monthly income. Maybe in you know, I make 40,000, but my, my true W-2 is 47. We'll take the highest number on your W-2 and divide, and divide it by 12 months. That's your gross monthly income. You're going to take that figure and then you start to plug in the number, right? right. So for FHA, your debt can go up to 56.99. I usually go down to 55. Um, so your total debt can go up to 55. So if you make $40,000 a year, we divide it by 12, and then you multiply that 3333333 number times point. Uh, let's just do 55%. So that means your total debt cannot exceed uh, $1,833.33. And that includes rent? So if you have a current lease or if you have current rent, we do not consider that because it is kind of uh, the given that when you buy a house, you're going to get out of your lease and your rent. So there's not many loan officers that are going to Right. Right. So, and you're not saying like a credit. Let's say they have a car payment of four hundred, but they owe twenty thousand on the car. So, so we only consider your monthly liabilities. So you're not responsible monthly for the whole twenty thousand every month, right? Mm -hmm. You're only responsible for the four hundred, the car payment, payment right? Yeah. So that's all we're going to consider. So in this same situation, where you have the forty thousand dollars a year divided by twelve months calculator escaped me. Uh, so, and then you multiply that times 55. So now you have $1,833 to work with. Now what happens? Now we start subtracting your monthly liabilities. So if you have a $400 car, you're down to $1,433. And if you have any other debt, well, um, $1,433 nowadays is probably going to get you between $175 and $185 of purchase. So that means $1,433 a month will get you like a $175 or $185, maybe $190 purchase. So a family that has like an income of $4,000, $5,000, $4,000 yeah. a month. Yeah, that's they definitely can make it. They can buy something maybe Absolutely. Two, $250, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So it's not, it's not like a, it's not impossible. impossible because no. we have very... Very beautiful homes for that price. Yeah, brand yes. new. You can brand get a brand new, new construction uh, three two for about two fifty right now. Yes. So and sometimes gorgeous. they help a little bit with the closing yeah. costs and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So. They do. Right now, um, I'd say in the past two months, probably ninety percent of all the contracts I've closed and have in my pipeline are um, are they they all have seller concessions. So that means that the seller has you know helped them towards closing costs. Some sellers don't, uh, but there's a lot of contractors out there and a lot of sellers, especially for new construction, that are giving back towards. Uh, yeah, they're giving the stimulus. To right. them, you know, oh, yeah. Sell those houses. Quite so, a bit. I think so it's possible homes, for a family them. that has an income of yeah. $1,000 to get it home. Yes. Easily. So That's around $40,000 of income 
if you have that and you have a car payment of 400 and less, it, it is viable for sure. Can you explain a little more about how a cosign signing? Yeah. Um, so uh, a co-signer is what we call a non-occupant co-borrower. So someone who's going to sign with you but not live in the house. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's say um, you didn't make enough to qualify for a house, but maybe you had like an aunt or a father or mother that would co-sign for you. They're basically going to put their credit and they're, they're going to be on the hook for the loan. And um, they would sign with you. We'd be able to use their, you know, we would determine their income, their DPI, their debt versus income. And then we would determine your debt to income. So if there's a lot of surplus there, that would kind of approve you for more. And um, and that's pretty much it. They would co-sign for you. We do determine the lowest um, credit score of the both. So if mom and dad have 800, 812, 840, and you have 650, you know, 660, 670, the credit score that we, or that we use for qualification would be the 650. Uh, so we're going to go off the lower of the middle scores mm -hmm. um, for, for both borrowers. And everybody's going to be on the D. Why? Why did you use I'm sorry. So, so the quick that. answer would be yes. Everybody who's on the mortgage has to be on title. But if you want to add, you know, a, 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 a brother that's close or an aunt that's close, if you want to add them on the title, they don't have to be on the mortgage. They can just be added on title. So to your question, what's the uh, well, why do they use the, the lower? lower. Uh, well, the person, the kind of the way the investors think, the people lending you the money, it's all risk, right? Mm -hmm. So if you have an 800 credit score borrower and a 600 credit score borrower, they're shelling out money and they're the, the most risk is represented by the person with the 600 credit score borrower. So that's how they're going to determine that. So like in the non- uh, I hate to say that word That's here. the money game. Yes. So like <laughs> in some other loans where they only qualify like bank statements or they qualify you on like a debt service coverage ratio, what the income property can produce. They don't care about your income and your taxes. They're actually going to qualify you on the highest borrower. Mm -hmm. um, but mm -hmm. we won't get into that today. Yeah. And even with um, property management at times, not often, but at times we will use a cosigner as well. Okay. Because, you know, if it's somebody that doesn't have a credit score or if they are very, very young and um, maybe they're going to college or something and, um, you know, they've, they've got no real income because they're going to college, they've got scholarships, but, you know, that really doesn't count as like a job. Um, if it's just a little shaky, instead of charging them additional security deposit or denying them, we'll have a cosigner to get them started in life. And then after about a year um, in property management, anyway, we can, you know, as long as all the payments were paid and, and the person actually looks like they're stable at this point, um, then we'll go ahead and remove the cosigner off of there. And then that establishes their own credit. So, right. because we do report good credit. So um, there's things that, you know, that help them like that. But yeah, there's a lot of different places where you can find a cosigner. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So if you get mom, dad, friend, boyfriend to co-sign on a loan, it's um, they're stuck with you for the life of the loan. Uh, Fabian, I'm no longer with that person or I want to get my mom off the loan. You basically have to refinance. Um, right now, it's really not a terrible idea just because of the interest rate environment that we're in to just get into the house and uh, interest rates go up and down, up and down always. So Get into the house now, and then, you know, if you see a rate drop, you can certainly refinance and potentially do it by yourself. It would probably be a good uh, fiscally responsible move to make. And I noticed that the refinancing rates are lower than when you actually buy the first time the house. Yeah, I can't really agree with that. Um, the rates are super volatile. Uh, and when you refi, we're going to use the same metrics. Oftentimes, you'll get a lower rate when you purchase than uh, oh, when you okay. refi, so it's, really? it's almost opposite. Um, and yeah, and sometimes, I the opposite. No, yeah, no. I, I so the reason for that is, um, you know, a lot of these first time home buyer programs, uh, some they of them with down home. payment assistance, they're, they're the, the state is uh, is collateralizing and they're they're giving you a great rate, like, um, so there's a lot more incentive to purchase homes right now, uh, lower rate. If you do refinance in the end, again, like you're hitting a moving target. The rates are going up and down, up and down, up and down all the time. Like in coronavirus, it's the lowest rates we've had in, in ever. 
and now we've we're three years removed from that so we're yeah. not there anymore but i mean the median interest rate over 30 years is 6.875 right. so right now we're, we're right at the middle i mean uh my in-laws when they purchased their first home they bought like 12 and a half percent interest it's just mm -hmm. what it was back then um we're still kind of in shock from coronavirus and everybody in the breeze and high yeah we, we get just to really good yeah. we but did we did yeah. have for a long time we had such low rates it was ridiculous but yeah. but something else i i normally recommend for people to at least look into if it's at all possible for them to qualify for is a 15 year because that's normally at least one point lower on the interest yeah. rate plus they're you know they're going to save not counting the interest rate reduction, but the 15 years of amortization, um, they're probably going to save about a hundred grand in, in, uh, interest, right? Depending on the loan amount, uh, a 15 year outfit can be very beneficial. Um, don't be freaked out if you talk to your loan officer about a 15 year and they don't have any. Um, and the reason is currently the market, the stock market is very, very volatile. Okay. So investors are very, very concerned about uh, coupons, uh, just the same way, you know, see, there's misconceptions out there that the higher the rate, the, the, the bank's making a killing off of you. Well, it's it's not always the case. Uh, sometimes the higher the rate, banks don't want to have anything to do with writing you an 8% interest rate coupon. Why? Because the first shot that you see a four or five, you're going to like refinance and you're not going to think twice about it. And now... You know, a bank has purchased that loan to collect that 8% interest for 30 years. They're never going to get it because you're going to refinance as soon as the rates go lower. So um, it's it's a very strange game, but um, nobody wants to sell you a high interest rate. That's crazy because no bank, every bank knows that they're never going to, no one's ever going to sit on an 8% for 30 years if they have an opportunity to finance. Right. So with the 15-year coupons, again, just because of extreme volatility in the market right now, Sometimes there's just not a lot of appetite for 15 year mortgages. And right now we're not seeing a huge difference, but you're absolutely right. Traditionally, the 15 year rate would save you uh, tens of thousands of dollars all day, every day. You just have to be able to stomach the pain. Yeah, there yeah. is that. There yeah. is another question. It's a higher yes. one. Time, uh, income, time. Yeah. Um, what is the How long the person has to be working to qualify yeah. for a loan? So great, great question. Um, a lot of misconceptions, not misconceptions, but kind of the standard in the industry is two years. If you can show on paper that you've been paying taxes and working for two years, you're going to stand a great chance and uh, of, of buying a house. And that's the truth. Uh, there are some programs when you have excellent credit, um, you know, a conventional loan, the guidelines aren't really that black and white. It doesn't really say you need two years. Um, so if you have great credit and maybe you've been back on the job six months, there's a strong chance you can still get a house. What about, for example, nurses? Yeah. I, I work in healthcare and they switch jobs constantly. Yeah. But there's no gap. They just go from one hospital to the other and they keep on working. Or the, the travel careers nurses too. Or traveling nurses that switch contracts all the time. Yeah. How do you guys work that out? So I, I want to be clear about this. A nurse that continually switches employers as long as they're showing that they're switching employer and their income is increasing, it's a non-issue, right? So if you're continuing to get better paying jobs um, and you're just a, a nurse, not a traveling nurse, Same please. Same career. Same career. Yes, if you're a nurse, but please do not mistake me. Not traveling nurse, 13-week contracts. That's a whole nother thing. If you're a nurse that continues to obtain jobs, same careers, and you continue to show that you're making more money, good for you. I'd love to help you. Okay? Now, traveling nurses. Um, my, son, my son was a traveler yeah. nurse, and I think he couldn't get a loan because uh, I think it was a gap between the contract or whatever. I don't remember. Yeah, so the gap is not really an issue with a traveling nurse it's because a traditionally a traveling nurse is going to work eight or 13 week uh, contracts, traditionally. Mm -hmm. And they're going to work multiple of these eight or 13 week or whatever the length of contract well, is. Well, during COVID, I think those contracts were shorter. Yes, there were like four week contracts, yeah. and there was a it's lot of that going on. Months. Right now, traditionally, I see a lot of 13 and 8 weeks, but you're right. Like back then, there was a lot of 4 weeks. Mm -hmm. So it's understood that there's going to be large gaps in, in your employment between these contracts. So um, this is going to go down to kind of lender-specific guidelines. But um, basically, if you can show for two years that you've been a contract nurse, you've been accepting contracts for two years, doesn't matter the gaps. You have a history of working contracts. 
there's no problem. If you've only been accepting contracts for a one year, it's going to be hard to find a lender that's going to, uh, because there's something called stability of income that is uh, one of the main reasons, main uh, determining factors that an underwriter is going to use to basically determine the eligibility. Does that apply to any other conveyors? As long as the person, like see, we're getting a lot of people from other states. Uh -huh. So they are actually working in the same profession, but they're just moving from whatever job they have to a new job, or there's no gaps. They just have a week vacation to move, and then they start working right away. Do you consider yeah, that? Yeah, so that's non-issue. That's okay. that's that's okay. great. I mean, if you are relocating here from another place and you're getting a new job, no problem at all. Uh, contract nurse is is not a sore subject because I have closed them, um, and I learned a lot closing them. <laughs> um, so it's just very – if you're a contract nurse and you're working these short-term contracts for 13, 18, you have to show two years of doing this, and then you're not going to have a problem. You're talking about continuing this? Yes, on, on like the, you can show contract. two years that yeah. you've got eight contracts. There are years. companies that hire them and they guarantee that they're always going to get a contract, but the, the paperwork changed from one hospital to another or right. from state to state. So they have to constantly switch there's a lot places. of this. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of um, places. They're probably not necessarily W2 either. They're normally um, uh, self-employed. Yeah. Um, and there's uh, also like semi truck drivers, well, realtors also, we have the yeah. same issue. So there's a lot that um, it's, yeah, it's your job, but at the same time, are you really an employee? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, that, that goes into a whole nother kind of financing. Yeah. yeah. So uh, nursing and uh, the medical field is very interesting. So there is, remember, if you're truly out there and you're watching contract nurse, you're accepting, you're signing 13, four week, eight week contracts. You are a contract employee. You need to have two years of accepting contracts. If you're uh, another thing that's super popular is per diem nurses that yeah, like just pick up mm -hmm. days. Mm -hmm. um, wow. That's okay. And a lot of times the per diem is where it's 1099. A lot of most contract workers for nurses are W2 actually. Wow, that's yeah. awesome. So, but per diem is a big thing right now. And there are a lot of them are 1099. So anytime we have 1099 income, a lender is going to require two years of working that 1099 income. Why? Because when you're 1099, you are responsible for sure, telling taxes. the government how much you made and how much was expenses. Right. So the government's going to be like, okay, you're going to tell me how much? Well, I want to see what your net income was over the past two years, and that's how I'll determine how much. So, so 1099 means that you're going to need two years of taxes. That's There's no way around that. Contract nursing, we're going to need two years um of showing that you've been picking up contracts for two years and then um gaps of employment like truly a gap in employment is like a big gap like three to six months okay that's usually going to need an explanation like okay. a letter hey what happened most of the explanations are not going to work and uh, <laughs> fair enough <laughs> um, but if, if uh but if if you have a gap less than six months there's probably a strong chance that we can still help. Okay. When the gap is over six months, there's a lot of literature that like has specific things of what you have to accomplish before they'll determine your uh, stability of income and consider your income. Hey, okay. Fabian, for that people that are considered to move to Florida and they have, you know, their jobs out there and they're coming to get jobs down here, um, what is what are their cases for uh, for to get a loan in mortgage program? Okay, so I have a lot of like, you think like welders, self-employed truck drivers. Um, well, let's not say self-employed, truck drivers that work for a company. I have a lot of truck drivers that their company flies them out all over the country to do the loads and then come back home. I have nurses that fly to Nevada and they work there three weeks in a row and come back home for six weeks, go work for three weeks. If you can show on paper and your W-2s support that income, it's a non-issue, right? You're a W-2 employee. You're flying that your company's flying you out to work wherever and you're doing you're fulfilling your job and at the end of the year the income supports what we need it to support it's a non-issue so welders you'd be surprised how many electricians they pay them to go and set up a building in another state mm -hmm. they make great money and they come back that's that's all great you have your electrician or your welder or your truck driver and your company is flying you all over the country now if it's the opposite um and you're moving like are we talking like 
they want to move here to live in Florida yeah. and they want to continue to work in their home state? No, I mean, they're going to try to find new jobs in here. Okay. So also not an issue. However, like if you are working at, let's just say like Dollar Tree, well, that's a bad one because you could transfer it. You, if you're working at, you know, Bob's <laughs> Hardware Store in Kansas and you say, hey, I make $30 an hour as a manager at Bob's Hardware Store in Kansas. Can I move to Florida? You can absolutely move to Florida, but the, the lender is going to have to determine how much you're going to make when you're living in Florida. But I make $30 an hour at Bob's Hardware Store. I've been there for 30 years. That's nice. Are you going to be able to travel every day to work while you're in Florida? No, no. it's not. It's not. It doesn't make sense. So, you know, people paint the underwriters out to be terrible people. It just has to make sense. Like if you come like what I usually if someone needs to relocate, if there's not an op opportunity to transfer, like within Publix or within Dollar Tree, if you can't transfer here, well, you know, work the phones, find a job with an offer letter, with a real offer letter from a company. I can work with that. Okay. And then, you know, we, we figure it out. And if you have an offer letter, we can certainly work with you. But if you're expecting to find your house, get qualified for your house without having a job set up in the state and you're not able to work remotely, it's not going to work. Okay. Funny okay. story about that. I did have a, um, a client uh, a couple of years back. He was um, from Boston. Absolutely the best guy to work with. He was so much fun. Uh, but his dream was to purchase a home, not only for himself, but also for his parents, because he just okay. like, really wanted to do that for them. He was working in a hotel in Boston. Um, they did not have one down here. He wanted okay. to move to Ocala. He went ahead and interviewed at a few different hotels down here um, with some vacation days. He was offered two different jobs. And um, so he used the offer letter to qualify for his mortgage. Absolutely. The question he had right after that is, um, okay, now, you know, I'm going to close on this house. What if I don't like the job? He's like, do I have to stay there for 30 years? And I was like, dude, no, <laughs> it was a serious question for him. I was like, no, this is not a prison sentence. Okay. This is just to get you the home. If you need to change jobs or if you need to yeah. do something different in your life afterwards, just make sure it's after you have the keys to your home and then you're good. It's just during that period of essentially a financial colonoscopy yeah. that they bake puts you through. That that's that's my yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. It yeah. is. It's exactly. what it feels like. So when you're under that microscope, that's when you have to have all of your, you know, ducks in a row. Um, but after that, if you know, life changes or whatever, life changes. Yeah. Know, and just and do that what you're gonna do. comes to a point of ethics. Like don't overthink it. Just tell the truth. What are you really wanting to do? If you're really considering that offer and you're going to try it out and take it, yeah. then do your thing. Yeah. Make it happen. Check out the job and see if it works. Right. Uh, after consummation or signing, um, the house is yours and the debt is yours. So yeah. <laughs> you're going to figure out whatever you have to do to satisfy yeah. that. If you need to jump into another job, it's already closed. It's it's now it's your responsibility to pay for that house. Right. Um, so an offer letter will work. Um, you know, when we're talking about offer letters, um, oftentimes lenders are going to require the first check at on or before the closing date in very rare cases they will ask you for the first check of your new employer after the closing date i will tell you this in order to be that very rare case where they'll say hey i took a new job at the hotel or whatever you know um and my first check i won't get it for three weeks very rare cases they'll, they'll take that check after it but you're gonna have to have like stellar credit yeah. in order to do something like that. uh we have Kurt here he's uh trying to buy a home do you have any questions that's everything. Oh <laughs> That's <God>. awesome. <laughs> We're like firing at the guy, right? <laughs> so uh, Pella did uh, mention on TikTok that there is the program Hometown Heroes. We were talking about nurses before. And um, Hometown Heroes just went through some changes, right? Yep, they sure yeah. Did. All right. Can you go over some of the changes? Because it's a great program, but there are other programs. And I think all of the state programs are currently redoing until july 1st yeah so um there's a lot of different programs that come from the state uh there uh and again it, it's not like state of florida but it is the florida housing finance uh corporation and they're the ones that are the parent company of uh, florida hometown heroes and the uh, florida bond program now these folks used to hang their hat on the florida bond program and then they made they rolled something out called tba right the bond alternative 
and the TBA is the parent little company for the famous Florida Hometown Heroes, which has gotten a lot of press. Everybody's mm -hmm. talking about it. Um, previously, that program was for our frontline employees, Florida employees, like uh, police officers, uh, veterans could also take teachers, advantage of it. Teachers, firefighters. firefighters, anybody in the medical profession. Um, there are income limits on it. Um, I believe the income limit has not changed. Um, and I'm not sure about that, but I think it has not changed because I was just messing around in there last night. But um, <laughs> but I don't think then. the income limit has changed. But listen, the biggest change uh, is that now if you work at least 35 hours a week in a brick and mortar in the state of Florida, now you are a hero and you qualify for this loan. Basically, so it's opened up to It's everybody. opened up to everybody. Um, so... There's a lot of opportunity. It's a great program. I read meters. Everything. I read meters. Yeah. So July is your, 1st. Is your, do you have a brick and mortar here? Is that, or is it like, you know, is there an office? meter reading in Georgia and there's no brick and mortar here in Florida? Do you have an office in Florida anywhere? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, you, you qualify. The main office is in Pittsburgh. Okay. But we have another office in Georgia, plus our companies out of Centerville and then Ohio. Okay. Awesome. But yeah, for sure. So the nice thing about this program, you need a 640 to qualify, minimum credit score. Um, you just have to work more than 35 hours a week. Okay, I bet. <laughs> and um, so you've got like 50 or 60. They're, they're going to give you 5% uh, of the loan amount. So. Let's break out our handy dandy calculator. It looks like we got eight minutes left, right? Yep. So if you're buying a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar house, um, and let's just say you wanted to buy an FHA loan, right? Uh, multiplied times 0.965, you're going to have, and then we're going to put in the mortgage insurance there, one point zero one seven five. So you're going to have a loan amount of two hundred and forty five thousand four hundred seventy one dollars. So they're they're going to give you. Uh, twelve thousand two hundred and seventy-three dollars, Fabian. How are they going to give you that much money? Yes. Well, they don't really give it to you, but it's they, they give it to you it. by way of another loan, or what's called a second mortgage. It's just a second loan. And what's awesome, and there's really no strings attached. Don't let anybody tell you different. Is that they're giving you that loan with no accruing interest, so that's just going to sit there for thirty years, and, and, and they don't require a monthly payment. It doesn't accrue interest. It just sits there, Fabian. It sounds too good to be true. Well, no, it's not. Um. That you only have to pay if you refinance or you sell the house. Next year, you have a life change. You're selling the house. Well, just know that you're going to have to pay that back. before you. It's going to be satisfied at the closing table. It's a great program. And a lot of things, what times what people overlook is that the rate. Remember, I was, earlier I was telling you yeah. that the states are uh, subsidizing these things. So um, right now, the Florida Hometown Heroes FHA is tiering between 6.375 and 6.5. And this is not let's make a deal with my lender because the state sets the rate. They don't fluctuate as much as like a lender rate but that our rates are tied to the market. Um, but the state sets the rate and they're, they're usually pretty solid. So you get a great rate. Uh, you get money that you don't need to make monthly payments on. And you can usually come to closing less than 5,000 bucks. If you get money from the seller for concessions, yeah. Less than that. You get the house for zero. So there's a lot of opportunity with these programs. I did uh, They're through the state. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A lot of opportunities. We're closing a bunch of them. Right now, there's no funds in the bank for this program. Don't fret. Uh, the governor just put another $100 million, and it'll be back open on the 1st of July. Okay. I think the 3rd of July is what the actual date is. Probably. But it'll fund on the 3rd of July, $100 million, which will last us another eight, nine months. So. Mm -hmm. I think uh, yeah, the first of July is the weekend. So yeah, yeah. The so I think the third is when that money's going to hit. But man, a great program. I'm doing a lot of them, and um, and there's really no downside to it. I want to move like yesterday. They just, okay. They just raised my rent two hundred dollars more. I'm so sorry. I can't even say nothing. Yeah. I, I've been stalling to sign the lease right now. Yeah. Stall. Yeah. Stall long and hard. Because <laughs> now my rent yeah. is twelve eighty. It was a thousand seventy. Mm -hmm. And they raised it twelve five basically. Mm -hmm. And and That's like not, you, there's so many people mm -hmm. going through, you know, the same situation. Yeah. And the best the best alternative is to buy, you know. You're gonna pay yeah. the same amount, it's gonna be yours. Yeah. yeah, but I mean a lot of that is actually a question that a lot of people have been asking, especially online. They'll 
they're like, oh, well, is it better to rent or is it better to buy? Because the interest rate is so high. And I'm like, dude, in 10 years, you're going to be paying the same amount for the mortgage. In 10 years, what do you think you're going to be paying in rent? <laughs> it ain't going to be no 1200 and no. something. It's going to go up at least as much as inflation does, which is what, 6 7%. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, you could just go ahead and tack that right on. So even if you end up paying a little bit more in interest you, right now, you can always refinance later and go down to whatever it is at that point. But you always know you're going to be at this rate. It, what if the interest rate goes up higher and goes up to like 10, 12 percent, which it's definitely done in the past? Um, and then you're trying to and then you're paying like two thousand dollars a month rent. And you're looking at that interest rate and you're like, man, I should have got it at seven. Right. There's no should have put a what you're stuck. Yeah. Like you may but not even qualify. I'm a, I'm a good witness of point. what investing in your property is because right now where we are in the market, they have their homes for a long time. So they have seen the return now. But I just bought my house to move last year. And my equity is like unbelievable. Oh yeah. it's way up there. So I tell people, yes, do it because you will see when you see that big number yeah. there, you know if you're making it. If I have to sell tomorrow, mm -hmm. I'm walking out with a lot of money on my pocket that I didn't have when I bought my house. <laughs> so yeah. I'm making money, you know. Yeah. So definitely, yes. Oh yeah, no, that's that's definitely one year. The case. And with that, I always, you know, I always praise you guys and everybody watching on the internet. You have to hook up with a good realtor. Because uh, a good, honest realtor is going to tell you, hey, that price, that house is worth it. Or, hey, that's overpriced. Um, because if you buy an overpriced house, you won't be having a lot of equity like our friend exactly. over here. Right. So make sure you hook up with a good realtor, uh, someone that, uh, you know, is experienced and that has a good team that can really kind of help you navigate through that. Right. So um, we are actually about to do something we've not done before. We're about to switch to Spanish. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> You want some water? Because you're going to be talking again. <laughs> so let me take. Okay. You can go, whatever you need to do. Yeah, take care. Yeah. Yeah. But I hope this has helped yeah, you. Hopefully you do. So let's have a chat with him for a moment. Oh. And then just tell me what you yeah. were deciding about. Of course. Okay. okay. Thanks for coming. It's great having you. Yeah. Let's see this picture. So let's have a chat with him. Yeah, okay. Okay. Oh. Thank you. Yep. Uh, we're going to switch to Spanish. Uh, I think it's the first time yes. that the company has done that. And yes. I think um, since we have a big community, you know, Canada and all Florida, this might be a helpful information. So since we're going to give uh, Fabian a break so he can kind of <laughs> release the stress, <laughs> I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, um, how, how is the process when you buy a home in Spanish? So, in este momento, estamos haciendo transfer a español. Andrea también habla ah, español. Solo un poquito. poquito, pero ella entiende bastante. Sí. Y ahora vamos a tratar de hacer lo mismo, pero en español. La primera parte, estos 30 minutos primeros, van a ser acerca de el proceso de compra de casa y la importancia que tiene tener un realtor que los represente. Ya sea que usted compre o usted venda. Eh, ¿Por qué? Porque eh, cuando usted tiene un realtor que lo representa, esta persona va a analizar el mercado y va a mirar si el precio de la casa que usted está comprando es el indicado. Porque lo que dijo Fabián cuando se levantó fue que es muy importante tener los números claros. Usted no quiere comprar una casa que... Eh, usted tenga que meterle más dinero y vaya a costar más de lo que el mercado realmente le ofrece a esa casa o le da a esa casa el valor. Eh, vamos a comenzar pensando que usted ya tiene una um, carta de aprobación de un lender, porque cuando Fabián venga nos va a explicar cómo es el, esta carta de aprobación. Los realtors comenzamos a está aprobado por algún banco algo que se llama una oferta y utilizamos los contratos legales que se utilizan para las transacciones de real estate en Florida. Hay diferentes contratos, dependiendo del listado, utilizamos el contrato también. No es un contrato hasta que no está firmado por todas las partes. Igualmente, si yo estoy representando a un comprador, 
eh, mi comprador firma, pero no es un contrato hasta que esté firmado por el vendedor. Una vez todas las partes firmen, se vuelve un contrato legal. ¿Cómo empieza este proceso? Eh, una vez tengamos el contrato, debe haber un depósito. Usualmente está entre mil y cinco mil dólares, dependiendo las exigencias del que está vendiendo. Por las uh, compañías de uh, construcción nueva, eh, es posible, ellos quieren más, pero... Sí, no cuando, más, un, un, cuando puede ser un constructor, a veces te pueden pedir más dinero. Porque cuando se compra una casa nueva, en muchas circunstancias no utilizamos los contratos de Florida, el constructor utiliza sus propios contratos. Entonces, él maneja su transacción con su compañía de construcción. Nosotros ya estamos un poco más orientando y ayudando al cliente cuando se compra una casa nueva, porque el constructor marca los parámetros de la compra, básicamente. Y en muchos casos, el constructor desea que usted utilice ese prestamista con el que él ha de alguna manera ha financiado su proyecto para poderle dar a usted todos los descuentos que en realidad ofrece. Cuando usted viene con su propia carta de otro prestamista, el, el constructor le puede decir, no, yo le acepto eso, pero yo no le doy eh, tanto dinero para cierre o no le doy esto, porque el constructor usualmente estimula que usted como comprador utilice el prestamista con el que él ha financiado su proyecto. Y así es que les dan muchos descuentos. Ah, pasando a lo que veníamos explicando. Una vez hecha la oferta, utilizamos el contrato para comprar una casa de resell, de, de reventa, no nueva. Nosotros utilizamos los contratos una vez firmados por todas las partes, el comprador y el vendedor. El siguiente paso sería eh, un depósito. A eso se le llama un scroll. Un scroll, yo lo explico como, como un marranito, una alcancía en donde usted pone el dinero y allí se va a poner el primer depósito. El primer depósito es como las áreas de un negocio. Puede estar entre mil o cinco mil o como dijo Andrea, diez mil. Depende de lo que te exija. Después de este depósito, mostrando seriedad en el negocio, ustedes tienen o nosotros escribimos ciertos días para inspecciones. En algunos casos ponemos siete días, en algunos casos ponemos diez yes. días. El contrato dice quince. Quince días sería el tiempo regular en un mercado regular para hacer inspecciones. Now, ¿qué inspecciones hacemos? Podemos hacer la cantidad de inspecciones que ustedes quieran. ¿Qué inspecciones hay, Andrea? Bueno, uh, home inspection, este, electricidad, um, <risa> el techo, el techo um, the air conditioning, aire acondicionado, uh, sí, the plumbing, la plomería, la tubería, and, and all of the appliances. So y los electrodomésticos. Right. Eso es básicamente eh, los cuatro puntos. Yeah, they'll look in the attic as well. So los cuatro sure. puntos y adicionalmente a eso miran el techo. También cuando miran el techo, miran el tipo de insolación que se tiene. A veces el inspector te dice buena insolación o le dice está desprendida de un lado. Uh, esos son los cuatro puntos básicos. Y es una inspección que se utiliza para obtener descuentos en el seguro de la casa. Sí. Hay dos inspecciones que se utilizan para obtener descuentos en la casa. Una de ellas es los cuatro puntos y el otro se llama en inglés wind mitigation. Es como, <risa> el, como los vientos, eh, me imagino que afectan el techo, pero lo que en realidad miran en esa inspección es cómo el techo está pegado a la casa. Porque debe cumplir ciertos requerimientos, o buscan que esté bajo los uh, requerimientos estatales de seguridad. So, con esas dos inspecciones, de Four Point Inspection, que es todo lo que dijo Andrea, más el de Wind Mitigation, son las básicas. Hoy por hoy, ¿el costo de eso es como 250? No, hay más que eso. Ahora, um, no sé. But that is for a full inspection, maybe. So the wind mitigation is about 100 bucks. Same then for a four point. Yeah, so you're right. Yeah, sí. probably about two, between 200 and 300. We'll say that. Sí, <laughs> entre 200 y 300 dólares cuesta eso. Ahora, si usted quiere hacer una inspección más profunda, 
se llama una full home inspection, dependiendo usted que quiera inspeccionar. Uh, puede costar hasta 500 dólares. Si usted, ustedes saben que aquí en Marion County también tenemos uh, pozos sépticos y también tenemos wells. Eso no está incluido dentro de una... Uh, do do no. they include uh, septics and wells in a full home inspection? Not normally. Normally you have to request that. Sí, eso es, eso es adicional. Uh, si usted quiere eh, inspeccionar el, el septic tank, el, el pozo séptico, yo creo que es como, yo tuve una vez un caso, en los desocuparon, el septic tank, lo desocuparon Ajá. y lo inspeccionaron Exacto. y volvieron a poner bacteria. So, es mm -hmm. like limpiar el septic tank sí, para por la favor. inspección. <risa> Son 500 dólares por eso. Me gusta esa porque, um, well, you have to have the seller pump the septic, so at least then you don't have anything. Remaining. <risa> es bueno hacerlo cuando compras una casa de todas maneras porque quieres empezar limpio right? y con bastante bacteria porque eso evita problemas. Ahora, eh, después de hacer las inspecciones, si usted quiere inspeccionar el well, eso es otra inspección aparte. Uh, si usted tiene, no sé, un generador de electricidad, eso es otra inspección aparte. Uh, si quiere inspeccionar la... There is not really uh, una inspección para las foundations. No. You can ask a company to come out. So you can get quotes from anybody or estimates from anybody. Usted puede obtener cuotas. Inspections. Pero no existe una inspección exacta para, para las bases de las casas. Mm -hmm. No existe. Mm -hmm. Sin embargo, bueno, después del periodo de inspecciones que usted decida qué inspecciones hizo, Terminamos los 15 días, los 7 días o los 10 días y nosotros decimos, aceptamos la casa como está, como comprador, y el vendedor dice, ok, si en ese momento hay algo que se deba mejorar, debe quedar escrito antes de que ese periodo se termine, ok, y se llama un, un, una, un periodo de negociación apenas antes de terminar el periodo de inspección. Uh, luego de que pase el periodo de inspección, eh, Básicamente es el banco que está, um, you know, manejando toda la, la transacción, que todo vaya bien con su crédito, que, que se hace adicionalmente un survey y el survey es las medidas y la delimitación de su propiedad. Cuando utilizas el banco, tienes que hacerlo es parte del proceso que el banco exige. Cuando compras cash, hay personas que deciden no hacerlo. Lo ideal sería hacerlo, porque... Sí, porque, sí claro, es más importante que todo. Y si quiere un uh, fence, uh, you know, más tarde... Uh, es, es. Si tú quieres poner una cerca, eventualmente uh -huh. es más fácil ponerlo porque ya tienes el survey. Exacto. Eh, la otra cosa que el banco te va a exigir es un appraisal. El appraisal es mirar el, el valor de la propiedad en realidad. Si una propiedad la estás comprando por 300, pero va el, el, el evaluador y le dice, no, esta casa vale 250, pues el banco no te va a prestar 300, te va a prestar lo que la casa vale. En muchas ocasiones, cuando las personas están vendiendo la casa, ellos contratan un appraisal porque quieren saber en realidad cuánto vale su casa. Claro que eso también lo hacemos nosotros, los realtors, porque nosotros utilizamos las mismas herramientas. Ah, miramos el mercado y miramos básicamente lo mismo, pero hay personas que sienten más seguridad que quiero que una, un appraisal de casa me diga cuánto vale mi casa. He tenido el caso. So, después de pagar lo que es el survey, que es las limitaciones, y de pagar el appraisal, y el banco dice, ok, perfecto, continuamos. Entonces, continúan <risa> con el proceso de compra. ¿Cuánto se demora el proceso de compra? Well, bueno, eh, tiempo, during this time, the bank is going to be asking for a lot of financials, over and over. So they have to be prepared to give a lot of paperwork repeatedly during that 30-day time. En 30 días, eh, el banco va a preguntar por muchos papeles. Va a pedir por su income, income sus income taxes, uh, va a pedir por uh, si tiene deudas, de pronto 
van a correr su crédito también. Um, es muy importante uh, no utilizar su crédito en este tiempo. Like, no. Sí, súper importante no. lo que dice Andrea. Durante el periodo de compra de una casa, no. No compre nada. No toque nada, ¿ok? No toque nada. No vistan nada. Nada. Ustedes se enamoran nada y los muebles y no sé qué. No utilice las tarjetas de crédito. No compre nada nuevo porque eso altera sus finanzas. Y el banco lo que está mirando es sus finanzas. Y si ya le aprobó, lo que queremos es que continúe igual hasta el final del proceso. Uh -huh. so, un consejo es no compre nada, espere que termine el proceso de compra de la casa y ahí sí puede hacer lo que desee. En este tiempo también no uh, cambio su empleado, um, no cambiar el empleado, mantenerse en su mismo trabajo. Sí. Eh, obviamente registrar todos sus pagos, si usted es un empleado independiente, que todo el dinero entre a su cuenta. No cambio su carro. No cambiar carro. No, es no, el no. mismo, pero sí, sí, sí. es importante. Correcto. Uh, bueno, mantener más que todas las finanzas normal hasta, y, y, y cooperar con el banco, estar muy atento porque nosotros los realtors te ayudamos a buscar la casa que estás buscando y nos aseguramos que sea una buena compra, pero nosotros no manejamos el, el proceso del crédito. En, este, en esta transacción, hay una persona para cada cosa y eso lo haces con tu, con tu prestamista. Esa es una información que nosotros en realidad nunca tomamos, que cuánto tú ganas, que cuánto tú debes. Nosotros no, no, no nos involucramos en eso porque eso es privado con tu lender. Uh -huh. En realidad, creo que hay 10 personas y 5 o 6, cinco o seis uh, compañías que ayudan a, a comprar una casa, ¿verdad? El lender... Realtor, sí, hay varias personas hay, en eso. Es ya mucho. vamos a hablar de eso. Hay varias personas que somos un, un equipo y cada persona tiene un papel en este proceso. Uh -huh. So, el, el oficial prestamista se encarga de darte el dinero y todos tus papeles privados de tus finanzas. Nosotros no los hacemos. Ah, una vez este proceso ya está andando, están mirando los números, usted está de acuerdo. Eh, todos los papeleos se llevan a cabo en una central y esa central se llama Title Company. So, cuando apenas nosotros recibimos el contrato, el contrato se llama Executed Contract, que todo el mundo firmó, nosotros mandamos ese papel a nuestra central que se llama Title Company. Y en ese documento involucramos a todas las personas que se llaman el, el prestamista y se llama los que están vendiendo y se llama el que va a hacer todos los papeleos. Y en este lugar te van a asegurar, te van a garantizar que tu casa no tiene ningún problema de ninguna lien o se llama en inglés lien, como una hipoteca que no se ha pagado, sino que te garantizan que el título de la propiedad va a salir completamente limpio. Y si hay algún uh, problema, el negocio no va a continuar hasta que ese problema desaparezca. What if the previous person didn't pay the utilities and there's a five hundred dollar utility bill? Oh, sí. No. En ese proceso, porque ellos miran a uh, que la casa no tenga ningún problema de ningún tipo, si aparece alguno, como dijo Andrea, de que el, el dueño anterior no ha pagado algo, debe ser pagado antes de que continuemos. Mm -hmm. um, entonces, en la compañía de título tiene un agente de título que es el que recibe dineros, porque nosotros no recibimos dineros, ustedes tienen que ponerlos a la compañía de título, le entrega dineros al que está vendiendo y se asegura de que todos los papeles y su casa esté sin ningún problema de deudas o lo que sea. Eh, luego de eso... Ustedes, um, si hay alguna contingency, que es una, como en, un, por ejemplo, si están comprando una casa y están buscando financiación, ese es un contingency. Para poder comprar la casa, necesitamos que se siga ese proceso. O hay a veces contingencies de avalúo. Yo compro esta casa 
cuando el avalúo me diga cuánto vale, no lo que me dijo él. Ese es un contingency. Contingencies son como... como oh, even the, the, something in the, besides the roof, maybe, um, oh, maybe they need to have to put a uh, new plumbing in or something like that, or maybe they need to replace the roof or something like that, so. That's, a, that's a parte de las negociaciones, sí, para que, para que el negocio se termine, eh, el vendedor tiene que completar alguna cosa. Bueno, después de que ya se ha cerrado, eh, el interés de que hemos pasado las inspecciones, de que las contingencies se han cumplido, ya podríamos decir que estamos casi al finalizar de este proceso. So, antes de que, unos días antes, como tres días antes de que terminamos nuestro, nuestra compra, el banco debe enviarles a ustedes, digamos, un, una, un documento final de cómo quedó el interés, cuánto va a pagar de cuota, eh, le da también un balance por todos los años, cuánto va a pagar cada mes, cuántos años, cuánto va a ser exactamente mes por mes. Mm, y si usted está satisfecho con eso, pasamos al siguiente. El Title Company, que es la, el lugar donde se hace toda la documentación, también les va a mandar a ustedes un documento en donde dice todos los costos que ha tenido la compra para el vendedor y para el comprador. Y si usted está satisfecho con eso, usted lo firma y sabe exactamente cuánto dinero se va a pagar y cuánto dinero va a recibir la persona que está comprando. Antes, el día antes de que vamos a la compañía y firmar todos estos papeles, nosotros hacemos una caminata de nuevo por la casa. El propósito de esta caminata es ver que la casa estaba de la misma, está de la misma manera como estaba el último día que la caminamos. Es decir, que si el señor dijo que había una nevera, pues la nevera está ahí. Uh, si dijeron que los candelabros estaban incluidos, los candelabros están ahí. Por eso cuando se hace la primera oferta, deben mirar bien, ¿esto está incluido o esto no está incluido? Porque a veces el último día en que caminamos la casa para recibirla, dice, ay, pero ¿y dónde está eh, tal cosa que yo pensé que eso estaba incluido? ¿Ok? Hay dos preguntas. Dos preguntas. <laughs> so, uh, do lenders and builders work with FHA loans for non-permanent resident borrowers with employment authorization document and 800 plus credit score? That sounds very personal. Um, maybe when uh, Fabian comes. Uh, yes, Roger. Um, when Fabian comes and join us, he's gonna answer that. He's a lender. Question: He's the lender. And then Juanita Torres asks, "Does the roof for a used home have to be less than 10 years old?" No. Well, not necessarily. You know, um, it's not new that um, we have been going through a scam in, in Florida, and that's probably the reason why insurance are going up uh, but the the roof uh supposed to last 30 years mm -hmm. it lasts about 15 years <laughs> uh, yeah. now with the insurance situation people feel like uh, i have to replace the roof but um the roof is basically uh good for the 30 years and when it comes to To buy a house that I have a roof that is 10 years already old, sometimes it's okay. Yeah. For for insurance, um, for insurance companies, they're requesting um, if the roof is over 15 years old, that it be replaced. Otherwise, they may not insure the house. It depends on what kind of roof it is. But um, if it's a rolled shingle, yes, 10 years. They will not do it after 10 years. But that has to do with the insurance. The problem is, is you need insurance in order to close on a loan. So that's probably where that question is coming up. So, right. Well, I know I closed in a house two months ago and that house is a 2005. Mm -hmm. It has its original roof. And when we did the inspection, uh, the inspector said this roof has a really good quality. Oh, that's awesome. And if it could last maybe, you know, 10 or 15 more years, I'm going to write down that on the inspection. Yeah. And for the owner, 
he didn't have a, an issue finding a, that's awesome, a insurance for that home. So I really think it depends the the quality. And if the inspection said that um, the house may need a new roof, then that would be a different case. You may have to replace it, right? Uh, if the if the inspector said that you your roof may have a longer life, so you won't. Maybe your insurance might be a little bit higher, two hundred or you know. Five hundred or four hundred dollars more, but uh, the answer or the information written in the inspection is, you know, very important. Yeah. Okay. So she she then asks, um, can you even get insurance in Florida? I heard Florida only has citizens. You can get insurance in Florida. <laughs> well, we have citizen. Um, yeah. Many of us have have citizens. Yeah. There's. Um, I like farmers insurance. It's really good. So I, it just depends. Um, but yes, there's a lot of companies that still provide insurance, but there are some that left as well that, that do not provide insurance in Florida anymore. So. But right now we can get insurance. That's, yes. that's the answer. Yeah. I have citizens on my house. I have never do a claim in my yeah. whole life. And I, I think I helped somebody, you know, buying a house like a six months ago. Yeah. He was coming from South uh, Florida and he said, I don't have a problem with citizen. I yeah. mean, I, I have If it's the least expensive, life. get citizen. It's, it's, you know, it's just another insurance company. It's just government backed. Mm -hmm. So it, it was supposed to be for like a last, you know, last, uh, uh, one that you would get, but because it's less expensive than some of them, it became first option instead. So. I'm sorry, we're going into English and I'm supposed to be in Spanish. Sí, sí, sí. <laughs> bueno, pero hicieron unas preguntas acerca de si una casa tiene un techo de 10 años, necesito cambiarla y en realidad ahí es donde entra a jugar las inspecciones. Porque cuando uno está comprando una casa y en la inspección, el inspector va a decir el roof uh, o el, el techo tiene una vida aproximada de... Entonces te va a decir que el techo va a durar 5 años más, 10 años más, 15 años más. Ahora, no, no podemos esconder que es difícil a veces encontrar seguros para casas que tienen techos viejos o aires acondicionados, más que todo techos. Uh, muchas personas deciden cambiarlos. Otras personas, si consiguen el seguro, lo dejan así. Uh, yo, yo vendí una casa también. Creo que la casa era, tenía un techo del, como del año... 98 y ellos se encontraron seguro cerramos el negocio y the right there in the line y hasta el día de hoy no lo han cambiado porque todavía tiene vida so, va a llegar el momento que lo tengan que cambiar obvio pero pues para cerrar el negocio lo hicimos así but, yeah and a roof isn't that expensive here anyway, no en realidad esa casa creo que tenía 1200 pies cuadrados Y es más, hace como unos seis meses yo vendí una casa y a la señora le dieron como tres mil dólares para ayudarle para comparar el cambio del techo y ella consiguió mil, mil square feet y ella consiguió el techo por seis mil quinientos. So, no a veces mucho. si el vendedor, si el que está vendiendo te da una porción y tú puedes poner cuatro mil, cinco mil dólares, pues lo cambias. Y abres más puertas para mejores seguros. Eso depende de lo que tu proyección y también el dinero con el que uno cuenta. ¿verdad? And it's in the best interest of the seller to go ahead and contribute towards the roof because they're not going to, they're going to have the next issue with the next buyer anyway. So. Sí, ya cuando uno está en la época, en, en un contrato con las inspecciones y que todo el mundo ha gastado la energía, el dinero, porque el, el, lo que es el survey y el appraisal, Esas dos cosas siempre las paga el comprador. Uh, pues lo que más quiere, queremos es que el negocio se, se dé y que todos obtengan lo que, lo que están queriendo. El que quiere vender, pues que venda. Y el que quiere comprar, pues que compre, porque por eso hizo la oferta. Entonces, a veces se hacen concesiones, ¿verdad? Uh, bueno, volvamos a los pasos de... Voy a, como a, a volver a tomar el tema de los, de los pasos para comprar la casa. Primero se pone una oferta. 
que es un contrato, pero no es contrato hasta que no todas las partes firman. Después de eh, recibir el contrato, este contrato se manda al title company, que es donde se maneja toda la transacción. En, esa, en ese title company, el comprador debe poner un depósito, que puede estar entre mil, cinco mil, dos mil, depende, cada contrato es diferente. Y ese contrato nos va a permitir tener entre 7, 10, máximo 15 días para inspecciones. El comprador, si tiene alguna duda, debe hacer las inspecciones que necesite para tener la seguridad de que la casa que está comprando es la adecuada, es la que quiere. Luego de que pasamos las inspecciones, si hay algo que arreglar, podemos solicitar que se arregle, ¿verdad? Es parte de nuestras negociaciones. Uh, el, el comprador, ya cuando pasamos el periodo de inspección, Básicamente habla con el banco todo el tiempo y cierra su precio de, de interés, su margen de interés. Es importante cerrar y decir, ok, me prestó al 5%, me prestó al 6%, eso pasa durante ese proceso. Luego de eso, esperamos ya que el banco eh, solicite el appraisal y solicite el survey y una vez todas estas cosas... Uh, puestas en pie y con resultados, pues podemos continuar. Una vez que ya están todas esas documentaciones hechas, eh, el banco le va a enviar a usted los números. Si usted está satisfecho, proseguimos. Luego también la compañía de título le va a enviar los números de cuánto usted tiene que pagar, cuánto le costó todo este proceso. Una vez usted esté claro con esos números también, firma y continuamos. El último paso sería ir a mirar básicamente la casa de nuevo, asegurarnos, eso se llama el final walkthrough, asegurarnos que todo está satisfecho, el comprador está satisfecho y ese mismo día probablemente firmemos papeles. ¿Dónde me entregan mi llave? En la compañía de título. Eh, no necesariamente tiene que ir el comprador y el vendedor a firmar al mismo tiempo. Las personas van y firman de acuerdo al, al tiempo que más les convenga, pero van al mismo lugar. Ahora se utiliza mucho una firma electrónica. Casi todos los papeles los hacemos por uh, firmas electrónicas. Uh, y uh, es muy sencillo. Cuando usted ya firma, paga, entregan su llave cuando se hace el desembolso al punto. Oh. Y uh, después de esto... Cuando estamos haciendo el cierre, de firmar todos los papeles, eh, es importante que usted sepa a dónde quiere que le mandan el DIR. El DIR es el documento que va a decir esta casa está a nombre de fulanito de tal. Pero muchas veces las personas dicen, no me lo mande, déjemelo aquí en la compañía de título, yo vengo y lo recojo. O lo más lógico es poner la nueva dirección de su, la nueva residencia que tiene, ¿verdad? Entonces, básicamente, estos son los pasos para el compro, la compra de una vivienda. ¿Cuánto tiempo eh, se demora este proceso? Eh, si estás pidiendo una financiación, el promedio sería 30 a 45 días. Yo he visto casos en donde hemos comprado casa eh, a final del año, digamos, el 30 a 31 de diciembre, 29 de diciembre, eh, con procesos de 20 días. Eso depende del prestamista, porque el prestamista, después de que pase el periodo de inspecciones, ellos tienen que eh, estar ahí uh, moviendo papeles y asegurándose que todo esté bien. Uh, el, el, el préstamo, como lo va a decir Fabián, pasa de mano en mano. O sea, no es una sola persona que hace tu préstamo. Hay una persona que mira los papeles, otra que... Eh, tiene que escribir el contrato, escribir todo, todos los papeles, y, y son muchas personas eh, en el banco que juegan un papel en eso. eso, eso depende de cuánto trabajo haya, depende de muchos otros elementos. Pero más o menos el proceso de compra de casa está entre 30 y 45 días cuando usted tiene un, una, un préstamo, pero si es una compra en efectivo, pues puede reducirse a 15, 20 días. Sin embargo, mi consejo es 
que usted le dé tiempo a la compañía de título de hacer las cosas correctamente, porque la compañía de título tiene un trabajo y el trabajo se llama hacer una investigación de que la casa no tenga ningún complique. So, eso toma tiempo. Mi consejo es por lo menos 20 días, um, porque cada quien tiene que hacer su trabajo. Y usted tener la certeza de que está recibiendo una casa, pues, en, en perfectas condiciones. So, básicamente, ese es el proceso de compra. Um, so, menos, there was a question. They were asking for your contact information and who you were. So, I put your info on there. But if you could introduce yourself. Bueno, me, yo me llamo Ingrid Navarro. Eh, trabajo con Andrea desde que me hice realtor. Aunque previamente lo que es real estate siempre me ha fascinado y mm, siempre estaba mirando el mercado y siempre he invertido en real estate. Um, y encontré aquí mi casa. Entonces acá estoy pasando la chévere y ayudando a las personas que desean comprar. Y si tienen preguntas, no me cuesta nada responderles. Con mucho gusto me pueden llamar. Ahí está mi teléfono. Uh, es 352 426-7735. Eh, recibimos, you know, ayudamos a personas tanto del extranjero como de Florida del Sur, como South Florida, o también personas que viven en California, Las Vegas, Oregon, bueno, New York, New Jersey, cualquier persona que esté interesado en mudarse aquí a Florida, pues nos contacta y verdad que nosotros tratamos de... Eh, sacar el tiempo y hacer de su experiencia la mejor experiencia eh, en su compra. Cualquier información que nosotros tengamos y podamos compartir con usted para que haga una buena decisión, pues nos llama. No hay ningún, ninguna, ¿cómo se diría eso? Uh, ningún problema. Aquí estamos para ayudarle. ¿Ok? Yeah, but you have um, contacts also um, that are bilingual, like you have Fabian in here, your lender, which I think Patricia just stole. So... <laughs> But sí. you have, like, everybody to help yeah. them. So it's whatever they're comfortable with. It's sí. great. Nosotros conocemos, pues, con la experiencia, siempre uno conoce personas, y aquí hay mucha gente bilingüe, que ayuda. Aunque Ocala, en su mayoría, cuando yo llegué aquí hace 18 años, era solo inglés. Aquí nadie <laughs> hablaba español. No, no, y tú decías, Luis, pero en Florida todo el mundo habla español. No, no. No, no, Ocala. Ocala es un lugar que siempre <laughs> se había caracterizado por ser como una joya escondida, diría yo. Yo vivía aquí, y vivo muy feliz aquí, uh, porque aquí nadie hablaba español. ¿verdad? Pero ahora. Ahora han diferente. movido muchas personas y la comunidad latina ha crecido. Uh, pero igual, Ocala, Marion County es súper enorme, es oh. súper extenso. Y la población por metro cuadrado, por decirlo así, es, digamos, en, en, trece, en una hectárea estaba supuesto vivir cuatro personas. So, todo el mundo tenía mucha tierra y vivía muy lejos. So, de un lado al otro te demoras como 45 minutos, minutos driving, ¿ya? Yeah? Well, it's uh, just a little bit smaller than the state of Connecticut. It's huge. It's huge. Es grande. Yeah. Porque yo tengo amigos que ven en el otro lado que se llama Silver Spring y yo los miro a ellos cada vez que hacen una fiesta porque ir a visitarlos a tomarse el café pues me queda un poquito difícil. O sea, voy pero de vez en cuando. No es... Uno se habitúa a vivir en el área que uno vive. Yeah. Yo vivo en el Southwest. Andrea es mi neighbor. So ella es mi vecina. Vive también en el Southwest. Y con las personas que viven al otro lado pues... Yeah. Everybody stays on their quadrant. Sí, eso es lo que digo. Yeah. Ah, tú, tú estás como en tu área. Si tú compras una casa en Silver Spring Shores, entonces haces tu vida allá. Si compras en el Southwest, haces tu vida allí. Si compras en el Northwest, haces tu vida allí. Y hay un uh, Walmart en todos los diferentes cuadros. En cada Walmart. diferente cuadro hay un Super Walmart. Y los restaurantes también. Oh, encuentras sí. el mismo yeah. restaurante al otro lado del town. Por ejemplo, hay un restaurante mexicano que se llama El Toreo. Hay uno aquí en el Southwest en la 200 y hay otro en el, en el 72, que es uh -huh. al otro lado. Porque te, te ubicas en el área que, que vives. Yeah. Yeah. Ahí haces todo. Yeah. It's just, it's too much space. It's too much. Uh, Juanita Torres hizo otra pregunta. Do you think house prices will go down? No, not from here. 
No, because they're really low right now. You can get a brand new construction 3-2 for $250,000. They're not going lower than that. The, 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 the parts and pieces are more expensive than that. So, no. Juanita, uh, you can find a brand new home here in Ocala for two twenty. Really? Mm -hmm. Wow. I mean, remember that Ocala is mostly, we have an urban area and we have rural areas. We have their roads too, mostly rural. So probably those houses that you see online for two twenty, two thirty, might be in places that still have no paved roads. Uh, are but, they gonna be paved? Yes, eventually. You know, <laughs> everything grows and it's gonna happen. But if you look at Summerfield area. In Summerfield area, you can find, and Summerfield area is on 484 going east. Mm -hmm. And it's, like, uh, it's a good location because you can take I-75 and come down here in 10 minutes. Yeah. You can go to the downtown on the other side, taking 441, 10 minutes. You can go to the villages, 10 minutes. Yeah, it's a good location. So really, it's, 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 and you don't have traffic. You still have, you know, the kind of the easy Easy yeah. lifestyle that we used to have here in Ocala. Yeah. But it's rural. It's rural. But it's good. Yeah. And you can find a house in there for 220. A 32 on probably 1,000 1, square foot. For 220? I'm not sure. I haven't seen the 220. Yeah. So it would be, be small. Be or small. you can find that house also, a small house, 32 in Dunella. For 220, frame home. Oh, yeah, frame. Then, yeah. So, or a block for maybe $5,000 more. Like, yeah, a normal, like, cookie cutter, three bedroom, two bath, double car garage, concrete block, 1,400 square feet, 250 mm -hmm. on a quarter acre. Mm -hmm. 250. Which is good, you know, you have yeah. enough space from your neighbor to your to your house. Because we're neighbors, but we're not like neighbors. <laughs> no, no, you have like a maybe seven, seven feet or seven or five feet between the line of uh, yeah, where your lot ends to your house, and the same amount from your neighbors. So it's gonna be ten or fourteen feet between houses. So you oh, have. I have more over. We we have more because we have car bakery. <laughs> I was like, really? No, no, no. We have more because we have car bakery each one, but. Uh, if you have one quarter, yeah, that's right. what usually is. And you're going to have a really nice, I just posted a video of a new home. That house was sold for $259 and is around uh, 1400 square foot. And you can see, uh, you know, how much backyard you're going to have or how is the front yard. And you can see, you know, the different qualities um, in building yeah. and different features that you may like. So. As Andrea said, you, you're not going to find something like this for lower than we're selling. This is a really good price. Yeah. And it's a really good place because we have uh, uh, accessible roads. Even if you are in the rural areas, you have access to, you know, move quickly. Oh, yeah. Here he comes. Right. Hey, so I finished basically shop. with explaining... Ya les terminé de explicar básicamente cuál es el proceso de compra. Los papeles, quién se encarga de los papeles, cuánto tiempo toma. Uh, y ahora Fabián nos va a explicar lo del chin chin. Uh -huh. <laughs> chin chin. Yeah. Chin chin. Pero no sé qué pasó, que escuché mucho inglés por aquí en una YouTube no, un canito, un un canal de español. Ok, well we have a question already from Roger Rivera. And he asks, uh, do lenders and builders work with FHA loans for non-permanent resident borrower borrowers with employment authorization document and 800 plus credit score? In Spanish. So, <laughs> eh, la pregunta en español. Ellos quieren saber si es que las prestamistas trabajan con construidores. Uh, constructores, gracias. Me vas a corregir mucho, yo. So, uh, <laughs> si es que los, las prestamistas trabajan con construidores. Eh, conjunto con préstamos de FHA, si es que el cliente uh, tiene residencia, o sea, si es que uh, no son 
permanente aquí en el país. Solamente tiene la autorización para trabajar. ¿En el trabajar. país o en otra...? Ah. Bueno, si es que tú eres un extranjero que estás aquí legalmente y tienes el permiso de trabajo, tú sí tienes derechos a un préstamo de FHA. Los requeros de ese préstamo son los siguientes. Tienes que tener la tarjeta o el EAD, EAD, permiso para trabajar esa carta y tiene que estar reno, renovado, renewed, eh, renovada. renovada una vez. Si es que tú me dices, Fabián, tengo mi tarjeta de autorización que lo recibí hace dos meses por la primera vez, no calificas hasta que te lo renovan una vez. En el momento que tú tienes la, car la tarjeta renovada una vez, ahora sí calificas. Ahora, el otro lado es que tienes que cumplir con los mismos, uh, todos los requeridos de la programa de crédito. Necesitas un puntaje encima de 640. Eh, necesitas los 24 meses de empleo para pintar un perfil o in, una historia de empleo. So, ojalá que eso te ayude con su pregunta. So, puntaje de crédito está en los 800. Tienes el permiso de trabajo. Ojalá que tienes uh, renovada una vez si calificas para un préstamo de FHA. Punto. Qué bien. So, la otra pregunta eh, sobre el techo. Acuérdese, preguntas sobre el techo no son para la prestamista, pero son para el seguro. Pero, ¿qué pasa? Si es que no obtienes seguro para una casa, la prestamista no te da un préstamo. So, si es que el techo es más nuevo que 10 años, si hay oportunidad. Otra pregunta. Can you get, even get insurance on a house? Uh, yeah, we went through all of okay, that. Okay, okay, listo. You're caught up now. But can you tell everyone um, who you are and how to get a hold uh, of you? Me llamo Fabián Gómez. Mi número telefónico es de 52581-9185. Estoy ubicado aquí en el condado Marion, en, uh, en la ciudad de Ocala, en la calle 17. Tengo una oficina ahí. ¿Tienes una tarjeta para que Andrés yeah, escriba toda la información ahí? Yeah, uh, por está? supuesto. Um, Yo la tengo acá. No te preocupes. Y lo puedes poner digital si quieres. Ok. Eh, ¿Cuánto tiempo hay? Tenemos 20 minutos. 20, 20 minutos. minutos. Lo que me gusta explicar en estas cositas es qué te va, o sea, para que tú um, tienes un mejor conocimiento de qué te va a preguntar una prestamista si es, es, si es que estás tratando de empezar el proceso de uh, financiación para la compra de una vivienda. ¿okay? Ellos primero te van a preguntar sobre los ingresos, ¿ok? Sus ingresos contra la deuda nos dice por cuánto calificas y su puntaje de crédito nos dice por cuáles programas uh, calificas. So, la pr primera pregunta que te, que te voy a hacer es uh, ¿dónde trabajas? ¿Cuánto ganas a la hora? Más o menos ¿cuántas horas trabajas semanal? Y pues después voy a eh, preguntar sobre el tema de inmigración. Eh, ¿Eres un residente permanente? ¿Eres ciudadano americano? ¿Eres un extranjero? Si es que eres extranjero, ahí te voy a preguntar, ¿tienes la autorización para trabajar? ¿Estás aquí de asilo político? Bla, bla, bla. Y con esas preguntas, más o menos sé cuáles son sus derechos para comprar aquí. Ok, después voy a comparar su deuda. Eh, sobre la deuda, tienes una mensualidad de carro. O sea, tú puedes tener una, un carro que vale 100 mil dólares, pero si es que la mensualidad solamente es 200, solamente vamos a tomar en cuenta los 200, ok. De ahí voy a pintar eh, la deuda de sus tarjetas de crédito. Otra vez, puedes tener 10 mil dólares de deuda, pero el mínimo que requiere la tarjeta es solo, solamente 150. Eso es lo que yo voy a contar contra su ingreso. Eh, muebles, si es que hay deuda de carros donde has firmado para familiares o hermanos o sobrinos, toda esa deuda puede contar contra su ingreso. Después de pintar el perfil de deuda, te voy a preguntar sobre su dirección. Vamos a pintar una historia de dónde has alquilado los últimos dos años, rentado los últimos dos años. Después te voy a preguntar, hey, ¿qué estás buscando? ¿Qué sería una mensualidad cómoda para usted? ¿Puedes pagar dos mil o no, Fabián, no puedo pagar más de mil? Voy a tratar de ver dónde quieres estar. Y después te voy a preguntar sobre activos fluidos, o lo que es efectivo en el banco. Eh, ese dinero tiene que estar en el banco mínimo dos meses. Si tú tienes 10 mil dólares en el conchón en la casa, pues vas a tener que mover ese dinero al banco y esperar, porque las prestamistas no les gustan, uh, no les gustan efectivo, y eso uh -huh. es la realidad. Ellos quieren saber que no estamos comprando drogas, ni vendiendo ser humanos, o sea, ellos quieren aliviarse de todo eso dolor de cabeza. So, el no. dinero tiene que estar en el banco mínimo dos meses. 
thought seasoning in English. Uh -huh. yeah. Y pues por último es la tema de uh, crédito, que como te dije al principio, eh, su, su puntaje de crédito nos dice por cuáles programas calificas. Todavía no tengo dinero. Pues eh, en este país, los Estados Unidos, más importante es su, su puntaje de crédito que dinero. Si es que me dices que no hay dinero, pues yo te puedo encontrar dinero sin problema. Si es que me dices que tengo un puntaje en los 400, Sorry. ahí... Ahí, uh, ahí hay problemas. So, pero tampoco, no, 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 o sea, eh, no te preocupes tanto. Si es que tienes puntaje en los 400, llámame y pues podemos obtener un plan para comprar casa en un año. Lo o sea, que tú quieres decir ahí es que en muchas ocasiones no necesitas dinero para comprar una casa. Correcto. En muchas ocasiones el gobierno o te pueden uh, subsidiar incluso el down payment. Correcto, cota inicial. Y ¿no? también a veces se puede subsidiar a través de pronto de, de, una, de un aporte de parte del comprador, del vendedor, eh, para, para los pagos del closing. Correcto. So, así de esas maneras nosotros podemos reducir la cantidad de dinero que tú necesitas para comprar una casa. Sí, un préstamo, digamos en este entonces, un préstamo de FHA. Okay? Ellos requieren 3.5% de cota inicial. Eh, para cerrar vas a necesitar alrededor de 8 o 9 mil de gastos de cierre para cerrar, ok, eso sí es que yo te puedo ayudar con una programa de asistencia que te ayuda con los 3.5% ahí pues cumplimos en ese lado, ahora qué tal el otro lado de gastos de cierre, dónde vas a encontrar ese dinero, lo que te está diciendo es que a veces eh, el otro lado, los que están vendiendo la propiedad te ayudan con gastos de cierre So, si es que yo te consigo el 3.5% y el otro lado te da para cubrir tus gastos de cierre, pues no necesitas mucho, es la realidad. Eh, pues en lo que yo hago siempre es importante la, la manera de menos resistencia, ¿ok? So, si es que ya tienes los dineros, pues no necesitamos hablar de estos programas de asistencia, es mucho más fácil. Uh, igual, um, hay programas para cada cual, eh, pero... Lo que yo te quiero comunicar hoy es no tenga miedo en hablar con un licenciado porque la, pre, la conversación es 12, 15 minutos y pues te voy a preguntar lo que hemos mencionado aquí y no es nada del otro mundo. Y ahí uno puede empezar. Ok, uh, o sea, como siempre digo, a mí me gusta explicar cómo jugar este jueguito de crédito y comprar casa porque cuando uno aprende cómo jugar y qué hay que obtener y qué, cuáles son los requeros, Ahí, ahí uno puede ir pues preparando para comprar su casa. Sí, lo que, lo que, lo que es importante es hablar con un loan officer. Fabián es una persona que es bilingüe y se dedica a esto todos los bilingüe. días. <risa> un poquito. So, cuando hablas con un loan officer, esta persona te va a dar un claro panorama de qué hacer y cuáles serían los pasos a seguir para completar los requisitos y hacerte a tu casa. Si tienes que mejorar algo en lo que tiene que ver con reducir tu deuda o mejorar tu crédito, ellos, sin ningún costo de pronto, te pueden decir, mira, haz esto, 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 y cuando ya estés listo, vuelves y volvemos a, a prepararlo. Uh -huh. Porque hay que hacer la pregunta a la persona indicada. So, no, pues digo yo que siempre tengo eso en mi vida como filosofía y política. Tengo una pregunta, busco la persona indicada. Y si vas a comprar una casa, no tengas miedo preguntarle a una persona, a un loan officer, porque él es la persona que te va a dar los parámetros reales. Uh, we have Roger Rivera says, excelente información. Uh, then he says, I have multiple renewals since 2015. Awesome. Uh, are two years required with the same employer or is it just the same line of work required? I have 15 months with the current employer. Can you do it in Spanish and then come on? Sure. So <laughs> la pregunta es para el mismo señor que estaba preguntando sobre la, el permiso de trabajo y cuáles son los derechos de una persona que no es residente permanente de este país, pero sí tiene permiso legal para trabajar aquí. Eh, la pregunta es si es que yo cumplo en esos lados de permiso de trabajo eh, ¿Cuáles son los requeros de empleo? Eh, que si tiene que ser, eh, uh, o sea, permanente a a si con el que... mismo trabajo o no necesariamente con el mismo empleador. So, um, no es necesario con el mismo <risas> empleador, ¿ok? 
dos, sí vamos a tener con todo lo que es FHA, y si es que tú tienes un permiso de trabajo, tiene que ser FHA, es, el único, es la única vía. Uh, si no es, estás aquí con un TPS aprobado con asilo político, eso es otro tema que podemos ir por convencional. Pero si estás aquí con solamente el permiso de trabajo, eh, solamente puedes hacer FHA. Punto. Ok, so, entonces ese FHA requiere 24 meses de empleo. Eh, si es que en estos 24 meses de empleo hay más que 5 cambios de trabajo, tenemos que demostrar que estos 5 cambios un, una razón. So, si es que cada cambio de trabajo no muestra una las, razón lógica o de cambiar, por ejemplo, más dinero o más horas, eh, ahí hay problema. Pero si pues has cambiado y cada vez que has cambiado es por más dinero o más horas, no hay problema. Siempre mejorando. Siempre o sea, mejorando. Siempre el cambio ¿no? de trabajo esté orientado a que uh -huh. estoy mejor. Correcto. Más dinero o más horas. Correcto. Oh, no me gusta el jefe. <risa> eh, 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 no le parece el jefe no es buena razón All right, and Ms. Torres asks if I purchase a home in a 55 plus can I put my daughter on the mortgage if she's in her 30s eso sería uh, tema so. sobre la el, el, la comunidad porque uh, the community has sus... no problem mm -hmm. yeah, as long as one person is over 55 It's not a problem as long as the bank doesn't. Uh, so la prestamista no le importa. O sea, ellos te están dando una hipoteca para una propiedad. El tasador nunca va a tomar en cuenta las reglas de la comunidad. Eh, para mí no hay problema. Y para comprar una casa en una comunidad de 55 plus, no necesariamente tienes que tener 55 años. Porque hay muchos inversionistas que compran casas en, en, en estas comunidades pero para vivir allí sí tienes que tener 55 años. Um, yes and no. <laughs> bueno, yes yeah. and no. Right. Yes and Porque no, mi esposo no. tiene más que 20 años, más que yo. Um, pero si nosotros queremos vivir en un casa en uh, 55 plus community, es, es posible. Sí, por lo menos Porque una tiene. persona de las que viven en la casa debe ser 55. Sí. Pero puede vivir con personas que tengan 18, 30. No eso. niños. No niños. No eso niños es. pequeños. Yeah. No, pero mayores de 18 o 21 sí pueden vivir, pero siempre y cuando el que, you know, el, el contrato de arrendamiento esté hecho por una persona de 55 o para que ingrese a vivir en la comunidad, tienen que llenar eh, algún papeleo eh, diciendo que yo soy quien voy a vivir en esa casa, así sea el dueño. Y esa persona sí debe tener 55 sí. años más. El resto pueden tener 20 ¿verdad? Ahora, también eso tiene unos limitantes porque algunas, algunos 55 plus communities tienen unas reglas de 80-20. 80% o 20%. So, si ya llegaron al tope del 20% de gente que tiene menos de 55, ya no lo van a aceptar. Usualmente no, no se completan, pero puede pasar. Okay. So, la respuesta para esa es sí, no hay problema. Al lender no le interesa quiénes van a pagar la deuda, right? Yeah. Correcto. Correcto. Pues uh, ya hablamos de cuál es, o sea, qué puedes esperar cuando uno habla con un oficial hipotecario o un oficial de préstamo, no es mucho, deuda contra ingreso, eh, pues y puntaje de crédito y activos fluidos. Ya hablamos un poquito de los programas que existen por ahí de asistencia de corta inicial o asistencia de pronto. Uh, y hay bastantes y hablamos un poquito de un tema súper interesante de sobre eh, a residentes que no son permanentes, que tienen permiso de trabajo, eh, sobre el tema de uh, a residentes que no son permanentes todavía, que tienen, están aquí de asilo político. Hay bastante esperanza ahí. Ellos tienen sus derechos también con programas convencionales. Ahí nos llegó una pregunta. Ok, average monthly payment on a new home. ¿Qué es un, una mensualidad, uh, un promedio de mensualidad a una casa nueva? Bueno, eso depende del precio de la casa y cuánto usted también ponga de down payment, ¿verdad? Y okay. lo que dice Fabián, una, el promedio de casa hoy en día aquí en Ocala, Florida, una casa nueva de tres cuartos, dos baños, estamos hablando de, digamos, 250, 260 y una casa de pronto más pequeña que también pueda tener tres cuartos, dos baños de mil pies cuadrados, estamos hablando de mínimo 220. 
So, para una casa de 220. So, eh, yo me gusta hablar en, uh, sobre, o sea, amont, el monto de préstamo. So, si es que, o sea, porque obviamente tú puedes tener un, un préstamo de 250 mil dólares, pero la compra era de 350 mil dólares y tú pusiste 100 mil dólares de pronto. So, como, como dijo Ingrid, pues depende en cuánto, estás, cuánto te están prestando. So, una compra de 250 mil dólares donde tú no estás poniendo, tú estás poniendo cero de cota inicial, eh, solamente estás pagando de gasto de cierre, como un programa de USDA, tú vas a pagar como dos mil dólares entre 1,950 y 2,050 mensual. Y eso incluye capital, interés, seguro y impuestos. Okay. Y Básica. seguro hipotecario incluido en ese número. Sí, yo creería que más o menos, yo he, yo he cerrado casas, por ejemplo, con casas en comunidades de 55, eh, por un valor de 200 mil, y he visto que la persona ha adquirido un crédito más o menos entre 1,500 y 1,600 de cuota mensual. Eso varía, como dice Fabián, de acuerdo yeah. a, a la situación personal de tu crédito, a cuánto das de down payment, mm -hmm. tiene muchas variaciones. Pero yo, yo sé que uno quiere escuchar un número y más o menos esos son los números que manejamos. Y un, una compra de 200 mil dólares te va a quedar la mensualidad incluyendo impuestos, seguro, capital, interés, seguro hipotecario, por ahí alrededor de 1,500 mensual. Más o menos. Más o menos. Mm -hmm. Porque es un diferente uh, precio cada mes para mí. Because we have different circumstances, right? right? So, same house. Different circumstances, different credit, different monthly payments. See, in, and this is the reason why sometimes the lender don't want to give you a number. Yeah. Because everything, he's taking the risk. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but <laughs> it's uh, very nice of you. Everybody, everybody's circumstances <laughs> different. You yeah. Know? But kind of, those are more or numbers. less, yeah. you know, it's going to be like $20. Yeah. Like, not much. No. no. Y uh, sobre cuando, como estamos hablando de nueva construcción, lo bonito de comprar una casa uh, completamente nueva o new construction mm -hmm. es que el seguro es casi gratis, como dicen en nuestros países. Eh, una póliza de 600 dólares, 550 dólares para esa casa es por el año. So uno está pagando psh, menos de 60 dólares mensual para el seguro. Ahora, en el, entonces, eh, en el momento que tú compras una casa que ya existe, el seguro va a estar mínimo 110, 115 y para arriba mensual. Pero cuando uno compra una casa completamente nueva, es, eso representa mucho menos riesgo para la compañía de seguro que te está dando la póliza. Entonces, uh, hay mucha oportunidad ahí para, uh, pues, obviamente, peace of mind, que uno no está pensando en arreglar nada por mínimo yeah. 15 años. Yeah. Y también el seguro de la casa es súper económico. Y también, por ejemplo, en lo que tiene que ver con las pólizas para sin holes, uh -huh. uh, son mucho más fáciles de adquirirles cuando compras una casa nueva. And you have the builder's warranty, too. That's, también es otra cosa. Sí, uh -huh. sí. So, es, es, es favorable y en Ocala consigues uh, casas nuevas todavía a muy buen precio, por muy buen todavía terreno. Sí. Ya, yeah. correcto. So. Bueno, y entonces, eh, después de que una persona está ya aprobada, pasó los papeles, eh, hay dos tipos de cartas. ¿Cuál es la, una carta es una carta de precualificación, la mm -hmm. otra es una carta de... De preaprobación. So, precalificación o cualificación, whatever, quiere decir que tú hablaste con un licenciado Encima de todo, la información que tú me diste, solamente información de hablar, eh, yo te puedo entregar una carta de precalificación. Eh, una carta de preaprobación quiere decir que yo te corrí el crédito, o sea, que el crédito. Yo he averiguado sus pruebas de fondos. Yo he visto con mis ojos un papel o algo de prueba de fondos o lo que son estados bancarios. Eh, y también eh, debe uno, un oficial debe, correr la sistema de aseguración o lo que es Automated Underwriting System, que la computadora me dio una luz verde y que tú sí estás aprobado. Eh, so con esa carta tú puedes acercarte a, o sea, a tu realtor. A tu realtor y con esa carta puedes ir shopping y poner una oferta. Hey, yo quiero ofrecer 250 mil en esta casa con un contrato. Y si es que el otro lado te acepta, te firma ese contrato, ahora estamos debajo del contrato y yo te puedo cerrar en 30 días y a veces menos eh, y eso es realístico, en 30 días tú vas a estar firmando para llaves yeah. 
So that's okay. Two more questions. Uh, Juanita asked, uh, so insurance is cheaper on a newer home? Yes, by far. Sí, um, es más barato. <laughs> Incluso algunos constructores te ofrecen mucho más baratas las, 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 las pólizas. Oh, yeah. Los mismos constructores. And uh, Señor Rivera asks, what is the maximum DT, uh, debt, to income rate, debt to income ratio on FHA and conventional? So FHA oh. son mucho más flexibles. Eh, y pues acepta mucho más riesgo, ¿verdad? Right? Ellas te van a aceptar hasta 55 eh, con buen crédito, uh, porcentaje de deuda contra ingreso. Uh, como estabas, estábamos hablando en, en inglés, eh, en cómo pues hacer el cálculo es tu, uh, tu ingreso anual dividido en 12 meses y ahí vas a multiplicar por este ratio de 55%. Y de ahí vas a arrastrar todo su deuda, el carro, las tarjetas de crédito, los préstamos personales, préstamos de muebles. Y después de ese número que te queda ahí es lo máximo que te va a aprobar un, una prestamista. Convencional es 50%. Hay algunos otros préstamos uh, convencionales que te aceptan hasta 50.5, pero uh, por lo normal es 50. Y acuérdese, para llegar a estos... Ratios bien altos, 49.99 o 56.99, necesitas un crédito, un, un puntaje de crédito excelente. Uh, so ojalá que te, eso te ayude, señor Rivera. Sí, porque eso también lo computan. Si tienes menos crédito, pues me imagino que tu radio se disminuye, ¿verdad? Correcto. Si tienes un puntaje de crédito FHA, aceptan hasta 5.85 y ellos nunca te van a aprobar un, una deuda contra ingresos de 5.6%. En ese Nunca caso sería 35 o 40? Uh, no más de 43. No más de 43. We have another question. It says, do I need a pre-approval for a newer home? Yes. Yeah. So, básicamente, eh, una carta de pre-aprobación para una casa nueva o, o sea, si tú quieres poner una oferta, necesitas una carta de pre-aprobación. El, lo que pasa es que muchas veces cuando uno va para una casa de nueva construcción, muchas veces ellos trabajan con una prestamista y ellos muchas veces tienen la prestamista ahí. Pero veces, muchas veces no. Muchas Eso veces depende. No. Más que todo son como las constructoras grandes. Por ejemplo, qué sé yo, D.R. Horton. Ellos van a, cuando llegas ahí, ellos ya quieren que tú hagas tu crédito con ellos. No, tú sabes, cuando, preferido. si tú estás pensando en mudarte aquí a Ocala, lo ideal es que tu realtor te y comprar una casa nueva, eh, tu realtor te va a, a guiar para que no pierdas tiempo. Y, y de todas maneras, hay muchas constructoras que tienen sus propios, digamos, lenders, pero hay otras que no. En yeah. otras, por ejemplo, Fabián nos podría dar la carta y podríamos eh, hacer el proceso de compra como se nos expliqué anteriormente. Mm -hmm. so, eso depende de tus necesidades, primero que todo. Tus finanzas, tu presupuesto. Entonces, todos esos elementos es importante que los hables con un realtor antes de comenzar cualquier proceso. Y uh, yo soy bien transparente, so te voy a hablar claro. Si es que tú eres self-employed o 1099, tú tienes un puntaje de crédito en los 600 y uh, el DR Horton, eh, los consumidores grandes, no es buena idea. Yeah. Eh, la mayoría de mis clientes son clientes de primeros compradores que necesitan ayudas, que necesitan los programas. El DR no van a manejar, el Lenar no van a manejar nada de eso, de Hometown Heroes, de nada de esos programas. Sí. Pero si tú tienes, tú eres, si te pagan W2, tienes dos años de empleo, tienes crédito excelente, encima del 750, tú puedes ir por cualquier lado tranquilamente y le va a ir bien. Sí. Uh, pero si es que eres self-employed, te recomiendo bastantemente alguien que sabe y alguien por, porque es, es bien diferente. Es bien diferente el proceso. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Igual, you know, uh, casas nuevas, uh, tenemos muchas constructoras, constructoras que han estado en Ocala por muchos años uh -huh. y también tenemos constructoras nuevas uh -huh. que vienen de otras áreas porque de todas maneras aquí se consiguen terrenos muy buenos y han encontrado que Ocala es un buen lugar para construir. Sin embargo, todas estas constructoras pues tienen que darles un año de garantía. Algunas de ellas ofrecen dos años de garantía y diez años en estructura. Um, La otra pregunta era si es que yo o nosotros uh, ayudamos con eh, 
con newer home offers. Oh, yeah. Sí, claro. Por supuesto. Todo el tiempo. Eh, es mi supuesto. favorito. Yeah. Yo también me especializo en eso. Yeah. Sí, todo el mundo te va a ayudar con eso. O sea, todos todo nosotros estamos aquí para servir, por eso estamos aquí en un sábado tratando de orientarles. Pero la, la realidad es que hay muchas ayudas y ofertas para casa nueva. Eso. There's also a lot of builders that don't necessarily advertise, but we know about them. Yeah. And so we have a list of builders that we can call them up and say, okay, here's what my buyer is approved for. What do you got? When's it going to be available? And then we hit, they never, it's never going to be on Zillow ever. Sí, la otra cosa también es que nosotros como creamos este tipo de vínculos con los constructores pequeños, medianos y grandes, mm -hmm. ellos nos están mandando a nosotros constantemente que está, le llaman las hot chips. ¿Cierto? Hot chips. No sé si lo pronuncié la correctamente. Esa, 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 de todas maneras, estas, estas casas, pues son casas que de pronto a, a veces están en inventario por unos días o a veces ellos necesitan recoger dinero y a veces hacen descuentos. Bueno, no siempre, no todos los días, pero a veces sucede. So, si usted nos habla, nosotros estamos pendientes de qué es lo que usted está buscando y si encontramos una de estas casas yeah. en esa página, poco, poco, <ríe> entonces yeah. Yeah. Eh, nosotros sabemos qué está pasando con el mercado. From now on, your nickname will be hot shit. Okay. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> All right. So Andrea will be calling us. Thanks, Juanita. We appreciate it. Gracias, Juanita. <laughs> awesome. Bueno, uh, yo creo que más oh, que todo ya terminamos right. nuestro uh, workshop. Eh, agradecemos inmensamente las personas yep. que están al otro lado y nos escucharon la carreta y esperamos les sirva y estamos aquí. Ustedes saben, uh, Great Expectations, nuestra broker, Andrea Ferber. Siempre aquí también disponible para cualquier cosa. Fabián, nuestro lender bilingüe, si usted necesita, por favor, contáctelo. Él le puede solucionar miles de dudas y le puede ayudar también a mejorar para poder adquirir su casa. Yep, es posible, no es un imposible. No piense que porque los precios subieron, que es un imposible, no. Hay es que prepararse, hay es que planear, hay es que buscar gente que tenga ganas de sacar el proyecto adelante. Y uh -huh. para eso estamos aquí. Yep. Y también mi amiga Patricia, aquí está Patricia para que hey. la conozcan. Hello. <risa> también estamos aquí, somos un equipo de gente que estamos para servirles. Eh, péguenos una llamada, esta es nuestra información y también estamos en YouTube, estamos en Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, todo, donde quieran nos encuentran, ¿ok? Gracias. Ok, gracias. Gracias. Bye. Good job, guys.